Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and it's another professional edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here. On another day, we are in March of 2024. There was noise in the background, but it is gone. It must have been a truck. And we're going to be trucking all the wrestling talk right to you. With this man, <laughs> the leader of the Cult of Cornette. He's going to get me going. The leader of the Cult of Cornette, Mr. Technical Difficulties himself, Jim Cornette. <laughs> Oh, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, for the for being out of breath. I also apologize for the audio on my side at the top of the program, because, and the reason why I'm out of breath is because I've been laughing to the point of tears at Brian Last's self-description of his hearing as super strong. And uh, uh, that uh, what's funny I about don't that? Think, what's funny about that? I don't. It, 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 I was saying that apparently you're the victim of a government, a victim, a victim of a government. <laughs> <laughs> See, I thought that was the audio difficulties. I didn't realize it was you doing your own echo. <laughs> you're the victim of a government experiment. Somebody has snuck in late at night into your home like you were the Lindbergh baby too soon. That was New Jersey. And that was New Jersey too soon. That's that's what, see why, that's, that's why I asked. And they've implanted something in your head. Well, you have a slight modulation. Nobody else is hearing this. We are, you're, you're breathing. You're smacking. There's, there's moisture in your mouth. Nobody else is hearing this. For God's sake. And, 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 you're maligning now the entire the, the Skype communication system around the world, and you're modulated. People, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, people out there of the cult of Cornette, <laughs> Good time. am I or am I not a modulator? I think not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, and let me just clear my sinuses. Ha, <laughs> ha. All right, you know, I, I know it's your program, Brian. I almost feel like we have to play the blooper now because you <laughs> referenced it too much. Stop it, stop it. Uh, I know it's your program, but I've had a couple of emails that I've actually found recently. I tried to start going through and, and gave up, but before I did, uh, from a couple of old friends, and I wanted to, to bring these up because it led me to one wonder... If I had told either one of these stories on the, on, I know I've told them in the past. I can't remember if I've told them on a podcast, told them on a tape, told them at a live appearance, whatever. We'll let the, John Fell will know instantly. He'll quote it chapter and verse because he's got the research documents. Uh, but my friend Kevin Wood from Richmond, Virginia, fine, fine member of the cult of Cornette, uh, wanted, to, uh, wanted me to tell a couple of Richmond stories. Have I told you the story about when when Flair and and as a matter of fact, uh, this came to mind uh, because I found when I was going through my files last year, I found my letter of reprimand from the Virginia State Athletic Commission, and I'd forgotten, I forgot I knew Flair and had got in an argument. He got a letter. I'd forgotten that I got a letter too at that time. Uh, have I told you this story? Do you remember what I'm talking about? I'm not have sure. I'm new ground here. I'm not sure. Let's hear the story. Well, in 1986, Virginia still had an athletic commission. North uh, North Carolina did not. South Carolina did, but it wasn't as, I won't say stringent, but they weren't as official and snooty as the Virginia Athletic Commission, right? Down there in South Kakalaki. And whenever you, basically, they didn't even send anybody to the spot shows in Virginia, right? It was basically Richmond and Norfolk and Hampton, the big buildings. And I, I, I want to say, yeah, somebody came to Roanoke also. But if it was a smaller town than that, they didn't really send anybody that I recall. But they always had the same guy in Richmond, Virginia. He was this big well, I'll go ahead and say fat, big fat guys, I remember. And again, you know, the athletic commission and inspectors and appointees in most of the states were always, you know, political appointments on a local or state level where it's a friend of so-and-so that's a fan of the boxing or the wrestling or whatever. 
But this guy was just kind of mope faces sat in a corner. And then they had another doctor that did the, the classic state athletic commission examination of by a doctor in those days was you would sit down in front of him, he'd take your blood pressure and, and look at you. And if apparently if you were breathing and had a blood pressure that wasn't in need of an ambulance, you got approved. And that was the examination. And, of course, everybody had to pay for their licenses and the whole nine yards that we've talked about commissions before. But this was, I don't, it was 1986. I can't remember what month, but it was right when Vince had either announced or right before the publicity was out. It was right before the WWF was going to try to run Richmond for the first time, right? And Flair's sitting there, and he started blistering the commissioner say you know what the fuck what or what is the commission doing basically in exchange for we have to pay you we have to have licenses we have to have our blood pressure taken the promoter has to have a license the promoter has to give you five percent or whatever percent virginia took at that time of every show in the goddamn state and now this guy's coming in to run against us, and he was going to the Richmond Coliseum. This guy's coming in to run against us. You're not doing anything. Because bear in mind, you know, I'm sorry, but it, at this point in time, this is 40 years ago. Vince McMahon and even the WWF, they may be huge in some places, but they're nobody relative to Crockett Promotions in the state of Virginia. If Vince has run... If he ran a high school uh, spot show in the suburbs of Washington up around Alexandria, that would have been the only time he would have been running, you know, any show or paying any tax or doing any business with state of Virginia, right, at that time. But meanwhile, Crockett is not only running, it, it's a, it was a tie at that point, I believe, between the Richmond Coliseum and the Norfolk scope as to what was the largest arena in the state of Virginia and the Hampton Coliseum wasn't far behind and the Roanoke Civic Center seated over 8,000 and Crockett was not only running all those buildings monthly or more than monthly, but shows all over the state and between all of that, the, the state was making tens of thousands of dollars in tax revenue on a you know on a monthly basis probably at that point if crockett's doing in 86 we did several six figure houses in richmond and norfolk if state gets 5% of that do the do the math right it's a lot of fucking money so flair's got a point what the fuck are you doing for us besides coming in here and having his doctor take our blood pressure and the fucking guy got lippy back with flair and but now i'm sitting there listening to it but by now flair stirred me up and i'm like yeah he's fucking right what the fuck well now he's not only got to hear it from the biggest star in the territory and the world champion but the lippy fucking manager half his age and he gets hot and storms out and uh they sent to crockett's office letters of official reprimand from the virginia athletic commission for talking to one of their representatives in a uh, disrespectful manner or whatever. I'll find it and maybe and read it on a future program. You better. That sounds awesome. And then, and there was one night real quick, and I can't remember all the details because I, this I didn't see, but we're sitting in the locker room again in Richmond, and J.J. and Arn had been in the ring. I think we were shooting TV, but uh, we're getting ready for whatever we're doing, right? J.J. and Arn had been in the ring some kind of way, and they were fucking with Dusty at this point or whatever the fuck they were doing. And some fan, some guy had hit the ring on them to get in the heat on, you know, doing whatever they were doing. And I just remember the door busts open, and Arn comes in with his fucking hand. God damn it, Jesus Christ. And J.J.'s like, I couldn't fucking see <laughs> They had, but JJ and Arn had both gone to get the guy, and JJ is wearing his manager suit, right? So he's got the nice, and he's got the nice dress shoes on with the leather soles and the pointy toes and and etc. And as they'd gone in their own specific ways to get this guy, JJ had tried to kick him in the face, right? As Arn grabbed him to stick his fingers in his eye, and JJ kicked Arn's hand and broke his finger. 
So it was it was a it was fucking friendly fire, right? It was kind of <laughs> But that was Richmond, Virginia, just in in the old days. How far was that the – well, I mean, I guess you had Baltimore. So I was going to say, was that the furthest north town you went to for Crockett Promotions? But you would have had that they had already, time going further. Yeah. yeah. They, they had already opened Baltimore. But think about this. Um, so Richmond to Washington, D.C. is – depending on which spot, 90 or 100 miles, as I recall, isn't it? Do you know? I wouldn't know. I've not done that. You've drive. not. You're no. not. But uh, it's you know at Richmond you go right up 95 and you're going to fucking Washington. Uh, I think it's 95. Or, well, never. It's been a while since I've done it. But Crockett was drawing. I do know that Richmond and Norfolk were about 90 miles apart. Norfolk is to the on the coast to the far east of Richmond in the state of Virginia. So the point is Crockett at one point uh, in that period was drawing 10 to 12, sometimes sell out 13,000 people in Baltimore, which is right above Washington. You go down two, two hours down the road to Richmond, he's drawn 10, 12, 13,000 people in the Richmond Coliseum and 10, 12, whatever thousand people in the Norfolk Scope. In that triangle there, that was an amazing wrestling area at that time. And then he would run Hampton, the Hampton Coliseum, and sometimes... You know, usually 5,000, but the, for the bash, it would sell out. And Hampton is in between Richmond and Norfolk. So it's <laughs> it was fucking ridiculous. The amount of people and the, the uh, repetition we got. Well, as they say, Virginia is for lovers, and I'd love if we moved on from uh, Richmond. Well, we will, because... I got another email from another old friend of mine, Brian Lieberman, who uh, he, he's a, a, a fan of the the piss drinking investigative reporting on the six oh five uh, podcast several years ago. He's ah smart man. Committed that chapter and verse to memory, but anyway, he had a question that I wanted to mention because everybody so Cornette hate women's wrestling. Cornette doesn't like the women wrestlers. No, I just like. I, I dislike bad wrestling of all genders, and I also am a little bit overfed with the amount of it uh, in, you know, the quantity of the promotions these days. But he had an interesting question because he thought we should discuss how Luna Vachon would have fared now in today's women's wrestling environment versus with talent like Rhea Ripley and on and on versus the time that she was in where it was transitioning from, you know, the, the, the girls being booked for a week or two in each territory and moving around is just a special attraction and, you know, weren't really utilized anywhere in ongoing programs and angles. And, and then the WWF 90s general, where they started using the girls, Luna was featured, but just as, you know, the, the whole thing started expanding, her career was over. And I thought that was a pretty good question because, you know, Luna, again, she was smart to the business psychologically because she had uh, she had grown up around it. She was uh, who uh, Butcher Vachon just passed away, we should mention, last week. And Luna was his daughter, uh, adopted daughter, before somebody does, oh, I got you. But she was in the family, and she was very took a lot of pride in the name that Vashon had from her aunt Vivian and Mad Dog, and not only in you know in the Quebec territory, but around the around the world with Mad Dog. And she was very respectful of the business, but she understood it, and she was smart to it, and she knew that. She wanted to be a part of it because she was fascinated by it. And she knew that as a wrestler in the days that she started, she was only going to, you know, be booked here and there every so often or whatever. But she wanted to be good at it when she was. And she understood how to work. And But she also understood that if she had a personality, if she could talk, if she could do everything in wrestling, if she could be crazy, whatever 
then she could get used in angles with the guys, Kevin Sullivan's group, right? That was huge and went for a while in Florida. And because she had the personality, if she was in the corner looking crazy and she could take bumps and she was a personality, but at the, like Sherry. But at the same time, she can work with in the main event guys programs instead of just being somebody on the card every once in a while. And she got good at that. So she was well-rounded. And that's what now that the, the females have a chance to perform for, for good or bad, hers was good. It would have benefited her and she could talk. She, and she didn't need to be handed, you know, a script and uh, just give her the fucking idea. She's going to do it the way Looney would do it, right? So I think that, it, that unfortunately, she was just ahead of her time not in any kind of, you know, she wasn't ahead of her time and have a Coronas off the top rope. And I mean, she probably would have dove through any amount of furniture because she was tougher than lead, but she understood the business. She could have been much bigger of a personality now that the good and bad women are allowed to be much bigger personalities. I think she would have prospered. I think if Luna was here, she would hate your audio. Also, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she would be uh, getting dropped at her head by one of the unprofessional women in AEW right now. Well, I think she'd be getting back up and dropping a few back uh, yeah. uh, the other way. And then they would punish her by suspending her with pay forever. <laughs> the AEW way. But anyway, but that, you know, I've got a VHS tape on my shelf right here in the office of me working with Luna at a spot show in Connecticut. Intergender wrestling with Jim Cornette. Because it was, when I was... Because you found a woman looking, who could work better than you can, for once. Well, well, and, and definitely did. She let me lead it, however, because I was the heel. But, uh, but the thing is, is, it was when I was booking spot shows for this gentleman in Connecticut... While I was up there and I was booking the third party t talent to the promoters, right? And getting the the guys there and girls that weren't getting a lot of work, they could work for, you know, wrestling promoters. The Steve Austins of the world would get the big mall autograph signings. Well, one of the guys who was doing the big mall autograph signings wanted to run spot shows. And he was hooked up with some of these high schools in Connecticut. So he would have booked through me the the guys and girls that weren't working and weren't getting a lot of dates, and then he'd have me for an extra fee, to be quite honest, to discuss between he and I and not related to any deal with the World Wrestling Federation or its associates. I put the card together for him and put finishes together so that the people would be happy and blah, blah, blah. And one time it came up and we had Luna and I can't remember if she was going to be in somebody else or, or if she, I can't remember how it came up, but I said, well, Hey, you want to just work with me and we'll both work on the show. Right. And then I'll pay myself for wrestling. And she said, yes. And we did the heel manager versus baby face girl. I came out, I fucking cut a promo on this packed fucking, he had 2,500 people at this goddamn big high school gym in Connecticut. I'd have to look at my book to remember the town. And they were fucking raving crazy because it was all the local people he was tied into. They hadn't seen a lot of live wrestling. And they're seeing all these people from television. So I cut the promo and insulted them. Luna came out, babyface rah-rah, and we worked a Tennessee spot show match, which she understood exactly. Probably the only other human in that building besides me that knew the Tennessee tiptoe spot at that point in time. And it, there was 500 kids below the age of 12 in the audience, and they went absolutely ape shit. And she beat the shit out of me because she was a muscular woman, and I'm a wimpy heel manager. And uh, it, it, but anyway, that was that's the kind of thing that she was good at is just going out and working, just call the shit in you know in the ring, and uh, what the people are enjoying, the simple things in life. And make it make sense. And uh, so I, I really think she would have done well. She would have done well in AEW because she had uh, experience working with Dink. <laughs> what, the, 
Wait a minute. What? Now you're a bigger <laughs> WWF expert than I am. When did Luna have a program with Dink? It was Luna and Bam Bam versus Doink and Dink. Oh, God damn, that's right. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. There are perils when it comes to working with midgets. You know, let's say they, they shoot you off and they go for a gut shot when you're coming off the ropes. If their aim is off, you're fucked. I found that out the hard way with Butch Cassidy, the world's meanest midget wrestler in Cookville, Tennessee. I'll have you know. All right, well, it's your program. Did I mention that all the Jim Cornette merchandise is going back on sale at jimcornette.com on Saturday, March 9th, which is going to be about the time y'all are hearing this. Uh, now that we have caught up and uh, uh, made all of the customers happy with the orders for the tag team action figure sets, which, of course, the Midnight Express, both versions or the Heavenly Bodies are still available now at jimcornette.com with even a shorter wait time than it has been for the past few weeks because we've caught up. Still, it's not going to be instant now. We're not fucking Amazon, but it's going to be briefer than normal. How about that? How about that? How about that? You tell me. How about that? Well, I'm, I'm about it, about it. All right. Well, there's no transition There's some kind of funny business that. over here going on. I don't know about you. I, I don't know about the funny business over there, but like a cyclops, I am determined to look straight ahead, and I shouldn't use that phrase now that I think about it today. <laughs> but we have a lot of things to talk about, a lot of things to review. Why don't we start with whatever you saw on Raw and get that out of the way. Oh, boy. Let me, let me dig deep in my notepad here because there have been so many programs that we've tried to pay attention to over the past several days. Um, this was Raw from March the 4th, and it, it broke all of the patterns, all of the norms, all of the the uh you know the pattern that that this show has been in and that there was only one big major speech i tuned in to see raw for the speeches and i only they they gave us a bunch of wrestling matches so there's no need to talk about those but the big speech the 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 one that really furthers along our our path to the next big speech on friday which everybody's waiting for was the one with Cody Rhodes and Seth Franklin Rollins. And by the way, they were in San Antonio. How many people did they have? Can you Google this information or is this at your fingertips? How many people did they have in San Antonio fucking Texas? Are you speaking to me? I and I can't not, hear I you. was looking up the information you requested. Give me a moment. Well, you could, you could say like they do at the cash register at the Wendy's. Uh, just a moment, sir, or something like that. I'm not listening to your etiquette thoughts about the cash register anywhere. What arena was this? Well, I, I don't know because it, it wasn't the Joe and Harry Freeman Coliseum. That's where we used to have our shining moments in San Antonio. It's a big new fucking building. This shit looked oh. like Madison Square Garden from the outside. Here it is, Russell Ticks. Final count for Monday Night Raw, the Frost Bank Center. Frost Bank Center. This looked this looked as big as San Antonio was last time I was down there. Tickets distributed 13,748. Jesus it Christ. It is the fifth consecutive TV sellout for WWE. The fuck? And the announced attendance was 14,866. The last time they were there for SmackDown in October was 14,149. Um, they turned San Antonio into a hot market. I was about to say, Jesus, hey, when I lived in Dallas, we went down there once a month, San Antonio wasn't drawing shit. I got to be quite honest with you. That is not the scene of any of our greatest triumphs. We couldn't buy a house in that fucking town. But, and they made the the crowd shots they did have look like it was a goddamn stadium show. And here's the thing, just again, San Antonio, my hat's off to you. That uh, I, The fucking building, the, the entranceway still cut off thousands of seats. How big are the goddamn buildings down in San Antonio these days? What the, it's overpopulation is what it is, Brian. There's too many fucking people. AEW just announced they're running the junction. 
Should be a hot show. Special guest ring announcer, Steve Stack. <laughs> That's right. Boy, for for 14 people and probably eight of them are in San Antonio, that was fucking hilarious. All righty. So they did a recap of SmackDown right at the top of the program with what's going on with the Bloodline and the Rock and the Cody and the Seth and the blah, blah, blah. And then Cody comes out and... You know, again, this fucking crowd, it was like somebody paid them to fucking, hey, just jump up and down and cheer some motherfucker. They loved it. They loved Cody. They were insane. I, and well, you know why? Because son of a plumber from Austin, Texas. He's the grandson of a plumber from Austin, Texas. And a plumbing business is big down in Austin, Texas. So Cody does the promo, and again, I I see a slim, well-dressed, articulate Dusty. If I close my eyes, I hear the, the cadence of things, the way Dusty would say shit just with bigger words. It's amazing. And bigger words that at times sound unnaturally stuffed into his phrasing. But yes, but... Here's the thing. If you analyzed all of Dusty's promos like that, some of them might be stuffed in there too, but he set them so cool. And he so had a flow. Smooth. That's he right. Flow. He had a flow. It sounded natural, even if it was yes. ridiculous. But he covered The Rock's, you know, Instagram video and 20 minutes on SmackDown and all. They calling the fans meth heads and. You talked about my dog, Rock. Don't ever talk about my dog. And I can sympathize with a statement like that. And basically, he said, Cody said, you didn't accept my one-on-one -on -one challenge. You changed it to a tag team match, like, you know, with a master politician you are. And finally, this is what I liked about this segment, besides the fact that people were so hot and it moved things along. And uh, I didn't like everything about the segment now. Hold on. We'll get there. But he finally gave the best explanation. And it it's because so, it's simple and it worked, but it covered it. Now, it, and probably he just it may have just got the the chance to, to do it because I, I can tell he wanted to. The explanation for this fucking switcheroony that we got put on us. He had talked to The Rock, trying to get advice. And he didn't say this all outright, but the, you see where, where I'm going with it, Brian, because you heard this. He had talked to The Rock to get advice, because why wouldn't you talk to The Rock to get advice about the bloodline, right? And The Rock tells you, oh, the people don't want to see you versus Roman. They want to see me versus Roman. That's what be the best for, for everybody. And Cody kind of sheepishly looking but not admitting it verbally. So I fell for that. He That's the kind of explanation that people could fucking actually believe, right? Or am I reading too much into this? It was the first explanation that's made any sense that we've been given several weeks after the fact. I don't even know if an explanation was really needed anymore. They kind of just moved past that point. I, I still started going think with it. it. I still think it it was because it brings it around, and you can point to that from now on. I think Cody getting the opportunity to close up a loophole that may have, have bothered him. But but anyway, that's the thing is, and then you fans, you chanted something else, and they chant, "We want Cody." That was that was perfect to not only explain it but get into it as soon as he says, "You you folks." You chant, we heard your chance, you wanted something else. And then it, it, it's we want Cody, and he's admitted that he got conned a little bit, but he's moved on now. And then he goes, we all heard that, The Rock heard that, that's why he's jealous, right? So now he's come back with this challenge that also involves my good friend, <laughs> Seth Franklin Rollins, and here comes Seth, and boy, he was... He was boogieing and woogieing and good Lord. <sighs> the, uh, the less that Seth talks sometimes in this, I think the better off he is. Cody makes the pitch to him. You've offered to help before. You've offered to help me, but hey, you got a, 
a big thing that uh, going on with Drew, if you want to focus on that, because it's also a big deal that The Rock and Roman are together. If you aren't on board with me, then I understand, right? And Seth again says, well, I said some things are bigger than us, and taking down the bloodline is the biggest that thing that we can do. And then, <laughs> I just, God damn it. And, and maybe because it's cute, and maybe because anything works with The Rock or whatever, and, and the nickname, okay, but <sighs> this was silliness where there didn't need to be silliness. He took the top angle, and he was flippant and silly, mocking The Rock and his promos, and I don't think it was getting over with the room, and I don't think it was getting over with the goddamn TV audience. He did everything that The Rock was doing wrong. He was lame. It was a lame nickname. How anyone thought that nickname would work in the room, there's no way they could have. It was just bad. It was lame. And like you said, it was not what this needed. Well, and, and the, nick, the nickname wasn't even the worst part of it because the worst part of it was after that he kept going on and that's when he, they quieted down, really, because they like chanting diarrhea because that's what he did, folks. He goes into this spiel where he's over The Rock and he says, I'm going to come up with a nickname for him. And then he fake thinks for a long time. And the, how about Diarrhea Dwayne? The thing is, if he had just said, I'm going to come up with a nickname for him, what about Diarrhea Dwayne? Well, then if it didn't, if it sucked as bad as that sucks, it wouldn't have sucked as bad because it looked like he took 30 seconds to think about that. And then it was a letdown. And, of course, the people want to chant diarrhea, diarrhea, and he, that gives him the opportunity to tell Rock that he sounds like wet baby poop. That's a quote, wet baby poop. But then he gets the flippant and the silly, mocking the Rock and the promos, and he just went, again, down the wrong path. Not only the people weren't interested, but he's taken the big main event that he thinks is bigger than all of us, too lightly. As like one of the Christians saying, ah, oh, Jesus is coming back. Well, okay, you know. But then he got a big pop because he said he was medically cleared. And that's, uh, that's wonderful. So they're not going to boo that. But uh, the, he will be at SmackDown Friday to confront the bloodline. And then, thankfully, Cody got back on the subject of The Rock again and ended a little bit stronger with he's coming to SmackDown with Seth to see the bloodline and tell The Rock off and answer this challenge. So we were 23 minutes into Raw by that point. I think you could have deductified a couple or three off of Seth in the middle there, and, and we still could have got the same points out. And I guess you could kind of bet on at least 30 minutes of SmackDown worth watching now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully with with the first, entrances, with entrances. Well, yes, with entrances. Hopefully the first 30. So that way maybe I could watch it live and just go to sleep. Um, but otherwise, that was, uh, that was raw. They, they had a lot of matches. We're going to talk about a couple of, uh, a thing that was announced and a, a couple of things that happened, but th there was just those pesky uh, wrestling matches a lot of the rest of the show, and there weren't a lot uh, any more good speeches. Well, no one loves zooming past Raw more than I do, but there was one match that we did hear from some listeners they wanted to hear your thoughts on because it became a weird bone of a contention on Twitter uh, the night of Raw. <laughs> I don't know how else to phrase it. What What do you call it? A weird... A boner of contention. A non-argument started, and uh, <laughs> everyone saw. But Gunther versus Dominic Mysterio. Yes, yes, that match did happen. No, Gunther uh, was walloping the piss out of uh, Dominic, but not in an unprofessional way. We're not saying that. And uh, I watched it, and it was, again, Gunther is of tremendous talent and works exactly as he should, and, and Dominic is really getting the, the hang of the bumping chicken shit heel, and he knows how he gets his heat. And this was a heel versus heel match, and it was with the, the big badass, you know, fucking foreign menace Gunther against the little Weasley goddamn you know, smart mouth heels. So people are naturally want to see Dominic get his shit kicked and they had a nice match, but I, it, the, the 
the most innocuous of spots that they did right at the the opening of the match was <laughs> apparently sent Uncle Dave Meltzer over the goddamn edge of the cliff like the you know the lemmings uh, falling into the sea and he started arguing pe with people and or knocking the wrestling business itself in order to justify I'm not sure what I don't know I came in on it in the middle do you have the tweetage that led up to where I saw this statement he made I think so and I'm just kind of getting caught up to this stuff too but because Dave is basically, well, I would just, while you're finding that, Dave is basically, you know, going off and arguing with people that either, it's either real people or sometimes even people with four followers that you think, could, could this even be a real person? There's no picture. He's fucking arguing with them, right? Or if they agree with him, he's then will make outlandish statements in furtherance of whatever they agreed with him that don't have anything to do with whatever the fuck they agreed with him about. And those people have four or five followers also. How does well, this man have the time of day? Well, this is neither this? Well, this is neither of those cases. And again, maybe less time on Twitter, more time correcting things in the observer. And then you don't get people talking about you reporting that Shibata had his brain removed. <laughs> but John LaRocca, and it says here on his uh Twitter profile, Booker for APW. 2008 to 2012, 2016 to 2019, and president of Premier Wrestling, former pro wrestling manager, 2005 to 2008, and a podcaster on the Fight Game podcast, WONF4W. So that's the Observer site. So this is someone apparently podcasting on the Observer site. Oh, oh so from he, the Bay Area, so, involved with so the wrestling he's business, on Dave's team. Right then. Well, he tweeted out Gunther versus Dominic Mysterio was such a fun match. Gunther is the best in the world, but Dominic's performance was so great in this match. Hashtag WWE Raw. Do you have a problem well, with I, any of that? No, I, I think I just kind of said that. And also, uh, he phrased it maybe briefer than I did. Uh, but that is uh, not only, I think, an accurate take, but I, I can't imagine why it's inflammatory to anybody. Well, Dave Meltzer retweeted that and quote tweeted it and wrote, I enjoyed it. Also, just remember now that any match where a guy chops the post full bore and gets his hand run into the same post, it can be ignored the rest of the match as the guy chops with the same hand <sighs> over and over as his key move the rest of the match so we could stop there before anything else <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting i really like this match yeah it was great however dummy here's what i think like there's a weird condescension and there's a weird attitude that comes into everything dave writes to people and that's one of the debates people have does he understand is he tone deaf and does he have no self-awareness and does he just not understand how he comes across or is he intentionally trying to be a condescending dick to people? Well, and, and see, this is his own guy, um, on his own team. You can see how he talks to his friends. No wonder he has so much, so fewer of them now, but first of all, there was a spot right at the start, bing, bing, bing where Gunther goes to fucking chop Dom and he moves out of the way and Gunther chops the, the we'll talk about the post in a second, but we'll call it post, chops the post. And then Dominic grabs his arm and sla or slams his hand into it again. So he's selling. So Dominic's on him. But then later on when Gunther comes back, he's, he's fucking chopping. And so I saw some people on Twitter saying, well, you ch if you punch a ring post, which uh, think about this, these big metal ring posts, if you punch a ring post with your fist, then yes, one good one, you should break all your knuckles or your fingers or whatever the fuck. You're not going to be using that hand again. But if you chop the thing, people know it's a goddamn open-handed, uh, either overhand slap or underhand slap to a fucking chest so you're using the meaty part of your hand of which Gunther's look like catcher's mitts to chop the post. But I will agree that if you chopped a metal ring post, you probably still shouldn't use that hand or should sell it for most of the match, except 
Has anybody, including Uncle Dave, looked at the goddamn ring posts on the rings in the WWE on television these days? They've covered up the metal ring posts because they had people, I guess, getting busted open or it's part of their safety fucking protocol, as well as having the padded uh, guard rail around the ring now instead of the old bicycle rails like they had 30 years ago. They've put a box. Go and look. Get a, a still frame of any of these TVs. The ring posts are all squ not square, but uh, how many? Six sides. What is it? Hexagonal? Maybe. May well, thank you. <laughs> I don't know. Graduate of major <laughs> university. I went to Nassau Community College. What all right. Well, then you can't know more than three sides. So, but it's a fucking box and the turnbuckles go through the holes. I think it's wood. Maybe is it aluminum? I don't know because they paint them to blend in with that ring post apparatus. But you can tell when they hit them, they make a much louder noise than if you're hitting a ring post. And they do that because they're fucking hollow around the ring post. So the point is. Would it be overselling it if you fucking got run into the god? Yes, if your head gets run into the thing, you need to go down. But if your hand gets run into a fucking wooden box or aluminum box that's over the top of a post and rattling around, it's a, it's, we're picking at nits. This is the fucking champion, Uncle Dave Meltzer, the world PR champion an advocate of no selling and provocateur <laughs> of the of the match where the guy just dove off the top of a ladder and took a flat back bump through six chairs and a pane of glass to a concrete floor and came back for the finish and he's talking about well he slapped the fucking post and he didn't fucking sell it. What the fuck? He has given five stars to AEW matches or Young Bucks matches where they don't sell anything and they keep going. But the one example he wants to point out is Gunther chopping the post. This continued. Yes, well, go ahead. Well, I'm just saying that. And, and again, I complain about a lot of things. But that's so far down. If you're going to complain about people not selling something, how much farther down on the list could you get than complaining if people got up after a body slam? That's what I'm saying. He's got something going on. Maybe the, the, the chemists at, at Pfizer might be able to fucking assist in figuring out why he fixates on these things to the point of obsession, but go ahead. Well, Pfizer's right down the road. Maybe we can get some answers. But John LaRocca replied, I get what you're saying, but it was an open palm to the post. Gunther has a catcher's mitt for hands, so I can believe he would recover quickly after the initial sting wore off. When they come back, Gunther is PO'd, switched gears, and dominating. Very believable. Any problem with that? No. <laughs> well, here's what Dave said. Don't worry. The wrestling Roy Shire promoted had it impossible to hurt any Samoan or African American in the head. In fact, a chair or post shot to the head would not only be no sold, would be the start of a headbutt after a headbutt comeback. So whenever people talk about realism and selling in old school wrestling, I usually laugh at their ignorance, <sighs> since it was and has always been cartoonish. Before you say anything, <sighs> real quick, John LaRocca's quick response and his more, I didn't say anything about old school versus modern <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> but just saying it's very logical that Gunther could recover from chopping the post and still be able to use it in the match. So a, a very puzzling response. But from Dave, Dave has gone again. Boy, that escalated quickly. Dave, to his own guy, has gone to, I usually laugh at their ignorance. What the fuck? And that's when I got, because that's the, the statement, the stupid statement from Dave that I saw. It's always been silly and cartoon. Now he's taken up for him to the extent that everything in the wrestling business, is, even the best territories in the country, have always been stupid and cartoon. So I've had enough of his fucking lip. I've had enough of his fucking yap. I've had enough of his goddamn droning on. And about, oh, it's always been that way. You're just ignorant. All of you are ignorant. It's so ignorant. And I usually laugh at your ignorance. 
You're fucking demented, Dave. You got Alzheimer's or a goddamn chemical imbalance or some fucking thing bouncing around in your brain. You got way too much time to think about it because most people don't want to fucking deal with you anymore. So I tweeted back at him and apparently trended over it. Now, like, I give a shit. I was rubbing Harley's belly. Would you like to read my tweet? Dave? Why have you become such an insufferable douchebag and begun making fun of the only thing anyone besides your immediate family knows you for and has earned you every penny you have? P.S. Hit fucking Barbarian or Ming over the head with a chair. See how that works out for you. <laughs> oh my God. Because now when he's a kid, he thinks back, well, Peter Maivia... Headbutting those people is equivalent to fucking my favorite young dipshits diving off ladders and cartwheeling through flaming fucking interstate wrecks on the way to goddamn barbed wire fucking death pits. And then coming back for the third segment, you fucking moron. I'm sick of his goddamn whining and his fucking trying to justify everything that the cool kids over there that he likes does just because his dwindling readership listenership or fucking membership eats that up like fucking pablum from his increasingly encrusted lips he makes fun of wrestling now and that's something that you couldn't ever say that he was doing for me he would make fun of individual wrestlers generally the ones that did stupid shit but he wouldn't make fun of the wrestling business now he's being forced at his advanced age, when he should be resting on his laurels of when people actually thought that he knew something, he's got to fucking get on his knees and blow a billionaire's brainchild. The problem is the brainchild is filled with juvenile delinquents that don't have any respect for the business to begin with and don't know how to execute it properly. But he's stuck with trying to make people think that they're the greatest thing since the goddamn invention of the fucking wheel. It's, <sighs> it's strange. It's weird. A lot of people think he's trying to hold on by attaching himself to it and, you know, dyeing his hair and just, you know, hey, you cool kids. But I will say, especially the last, like, week and a half, whatever it is, I personally heard from people who are friends with Dave, longtime friends, decades-long friends with Dave, who have had problems with his reporting. Just like, how could this happen? It's ridiculous. Also, I don't know if you even know any of this, but apparently his bio to Ole Anderson pissed off a bunch of people. And I didn't finish reading The Observer. I've had a busy several days. Apparently he also did an audio show. I have not heard that. But Dave, even in death, has put down Ole Anderson. Not that Ole would have <laughs> cared or anyone should feel too bad, but it's weird when you get your receipts now when the person passes away, I guess. Well, he, it, it stung him that Ole took the piss out of him a long time ago. And I guess, you know, this was an opportunity. But yeah, he, he uh, usually uh, in an obituary, he will acknowledge all points, but he'll come out with a more positive outlook. But he, this was the worst I've seen anybody try to diminish somebody right when they're writing their obituary. As well, but you know. Uh, it pays, but, it, pay, but, it pays and, to talk to Jim Barnett. And by the way, uh, <laughs> <You know. laughs> seriously, but what? One more time. Even if the what was being discussed was germane in any way to what Dave started then droning on about the the the, the tropes of the headbutts of the Samoans and the black wrestlers and the blah blah blah, which had nothing to do with chopping the fucking post last Tuesday or whatever. Yet yeah, there is infinite, I watched it. There is infinitely more believability in Bobo Brazil grabbing a motherfucker at six feet five, I believe it was, maybe six, six and 300 pounds and fucking bashing him with a fucking headbutt and him going down or goddamn Peter Maivia, or as I mentioned, hit fucking Ming or Barbarian over the head with a fucking chair and see how that works for you. Because I'm sorry, it's not a goddamn secret that most of the Samoans in wrestling, I haven't 
perused the general population of the streets in Samoa, but most of the Samoans in wrestling have heads that you don't want to fuck with. So that's how it became a thing. And it, it, that's more believable than these junior high school students doing these gymnastic stunts on furniture and thumbtacks. It's ridiculous. It, so even following his line of thinking, how is one more preposterous than the other? And why was it silly when people believed it because it was presented in a serious fashion and it sold tickets, among them to young Dave Meltzer? By the way, uh, to conclude this segment, John Waraka, I have one last tweet here. So you don't buy that Gunther can recover from chopping the <laughs> ring post and having his hand worked on by a Weasley heel, but you can buy that Kenny Omega can get stabbed in the head with a screwdriver... <laughs> by Will Ospreay and recover to wrestle eight to 10 more minutes and win for a six star match. <laughs> he got stabbed with a screwdriver. That was okay. Guther chopped the post that compared to wrestling from 50 years ago. <laughs> oh God. Well, you know, Jim, maybe Dave just needs a good night's sleep. I'm not sure, Brian. I don't know if Dave is one of these people who might be in a standing coma and can't really wake up. But folks, if you're out there in the real world dealing with reality, you need a good night's sleep to recharge yourself and rest yourself for the burdensome day ahead as we exist on this spinning blue marble, hurtling through space, through the atmosphere. You know what you want to lay down at night on and forget about all of that? Forget about the fact that we're Someday going to crash into a comet or a meteor and the whole thing's going to go kaput like the dinosaurs. Forget about all that. Lay down, rest your weary bones, and get a night of restful, peaceful sleep. Slumber on a helix sleep mattress. That's the thing you got to do. Because, I mean... That is the no thing you have to do, yes. No matter what your worry, no matter what is this dwelling on your mind, when you lay down, it's like a heaviness on you, and you look up and you go, hi, heaviness, you're with me again. But if you lay down on something comfortable, like a Helix Sleep mattress, you don't have that thought. Instantly, your thoughts leave you. It's like you've been shot up with some exotic drug made from a tsetse fly's blood, and you just drift off into a cloud on a Helix Sleep mattress, and they got all kinds. We've talked about the different makes and models, the, the various things that they do for you. If you sleep hot, they cool you down. You know, Stace got one of those. Said, we got to try this. And I sat down on this thing. I said, ooh, it just cools you. No more are you going to wake up in a puddle of sweat looking like David Jansen in The Fugitive. No, because this thing naturally cools you right down. And they've also, I think they have a heat up. I'm not sure about this, but I think they've got one. If you plug it in, if you if you get cold at night, like if you've got poor blood circulation, plug this bad boy in. It's like a griddle. You'll feel like a pancake. It slightly burns your buns, but nevertheless, you'll wake up in the morning all ready to, to go out and look like you have a pulse. And they've got 20 unique mattresses, including the award-winning Lux Collection, the newly released Helix Elite Collection, and of course that mattress for all of you unnaturally long or ridiculously corpulently fat sleepers and they the helix elite collection is good for people who don't want to sell that's true but at the same time the people that deliver the mattress will have to super kick you for you to accept delivery of the elite collection and if your spine listen to this if your spine is a problem Every Helix mattress, Brian, I don't know if you knew this, has a hybrid design. They combine individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. So you got comfort and support. With the steel coils, you, there is the risk of electro electrocution during thunderstorms. So as soon as you hear a rumble of thunder, get the fuck away from this thing. But once that the weather has passed, you can lay back down without being jolted like you're sitting in old Sparky at San Quentin. All you got to do, folks, is go right now to Helix Sleep, H-E-L-I-X, helixsleep.com slash J-C-E, 
and you're going to use the code HELIXPARTNER20 because when you take the little two- or three-minute quiz, tell them how you like your mattresses, how you like to sleep, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. I believe they also have a mattress for premature ejaculators. It, 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 that may still be in they development. They don't. No, they don't, and they won't, and it won't be in development, no. But, uh, well, it's, it's, they can't reveal these things to the general public. There's industrial espionage. The, but no, anyway. Well, industrial espionage yeah, over this, really. Yeah, and if you're a Darby <laughs> Allen fan, they have a, a mattress filled entirely with broken shards of glass. Well, nonetheless, they don't have that either. What they have are the most comfortable mattresses. Maybe you need something firm. Maybe you need something a little mushy. Whatever it may be, <laughs> Helix has it. What's that from? That's their their pudding collection. The pudding collection. The pudding <laughs> collection is nice. And you'll, you'll just feel like you're sleeping in jello. But right now, if you go to helixsleep.com slash JCE, use the code HELIXPARTNER20, you're going to get 20% off all of the mattress orders and two free pillows. That's, I mean, uh, how, how in the world are you going to beat that offer? Helixsleep.com slash JCE. Use the code HELIXPARTNER20, 20% 20 off all mattresses and two free pillows. And, and again, no matter what you want to lay down on, just ag again, if you're an AEW fan and you want one wrapped in barbed wire, they might be able to do that in the, in the Elite collection. But uh, you're going to get 20% off regardless of who you're a fan of, as long as you're a fan of ours. As long as you know who we are, that's all that matters. And get one of those kids' mattresses, too, for the dog. Get all the mattresses you and your family would need from Helix Sleep. One more time, what's that promo code, Jim? Well, it is uh, the promo code is HELIXPARTNER20, Brian. I've mentioned that numerous times. All right, well, check that out. We endorse them here at Last Manor. We enjoy the Helix Sleep mattresses. They're all different variety, and we have them. And Jim, wrestlers come in all different varieties. A&E biography, or A&E's WWE biography, I guess I should say. The newest episode this past week, Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, and I tell you, again, I, I loved a lot of this because we got to see such, such good footage, especially early. A lot of people don't know that he was someone in wrestling before Sergeant Slaughter. They don't know about beautiful Bobby Remus. And... You know, the training footage with Vern and his barn, I always get a kick out of. And I'm wondering, God damn, that was a tall barn. I'd like to have seen him when they were building that thing. They were way up there. But um, I really, I love working with Sarge. He's a great guy, was always fun, was a, one of the best working big men in the business during his, you know, his era. And, you know, when in the WWF, whether he was agent, commissioner, whatever, he could cut the promo. He knew how to get things over. He wasn't, you know, going to be an asshole or put his foot down about anything. And it's just fun to, to, to be around, uh, you know, backstage and, you know, just hang out with. So, because again, uh, you know, the uh, the common thread in a lot of these any kind of biographical piece on any of the wrestlers is that most of them were fans as kids and they wanted to get, they had an affinity for the business. They wanted to get in it. And also it didn't hurt when a lot of them like Sarge were big kids and, you know, played football or wrestled in high school. And we were talking about you and I, before we went on the air real briefly, that you never noticed he had a lazy eye. And truthfully, I didn't, you know, I I saw it when you would sit and talk to him, you know, in his later years, but it wasn't like it was a pronounced thing or whatever, but I did not know that he had a nickname. Apparently the kids picked on him, even though he's a big kid, when he wore his glasses, one lens was thicker than the other, and they called him Cyclops. And, you know, so... You don't think of guys like Sergeant Slaughter being the the victims of schoolyard bullies, but it, it it happened, apparently. And he heard about Vern Gagne's training camp, and 
You know, of course, the story was told. Had you had you heard this before that he got in a fight with Billy Robinson and Vern broke it up and and offered him a spot to come back to the camp? I never before, and and I hope it's true. I'm not doubting it. <laughs> I hope it's true, but I never before heard, as Sergeant Slaughter's wife put it, that he kicked the crap out of Billy Robinson in front of everyone. Well, you, you but know, it's, it's, but it, that that would be the all time whopper to make up. It's almost too outrageous to make up. Well, but the thing is, you know, Sarge didn't say it. His wife did. And his, his wife probably wasn't there in person. And I'm not trying to knock Sarge. I'm thinking probably that there was ten, tensions flared on both sides, and Robinson was neither trying to hurt him nor was Slaughter probably wanting to, you know, commit mayhem. But, you know, the, Vern got into it before it got ugly, I guess. It would be funny if all the guys that Billy Robinson roughed around all of a sudden start doing interviews saying, yeah, I kicked the crap out of Billy Robinson. <laughs> and then that becomes his reputation going forward. He got the shit kicked out of him by everybody. He's dead. There's no film. We can say what we want. Uh, but it seems like that would have gone around a little because the one time, right with Peter Maivia. But that was in front of everyone, though. You know, well, but at the same time, the, the, the it, it, at camp... There would have been some people at camp. But that's the thing. Who was in the camp? Because this is after Ric Flair, but Chris Taylor was in some of those videos, and obviously he never really developed as a pro wrestler the way they hoped, so maybe he was getting some extra training. But Steamboat was after Sergeant Slaughter, right? Yes. I'm not... Who else was in that footage? Well, it was Vern, it was Chris Taylor, it was Robinson. It was somewhere around 1973, though, so the point is... It 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 would have circulated. I bet at some point, uh, somebody in the AWA would have told it just because Robinson had tension with some people. But nevertheless, um, here I'm going to say this at the top of the program because it's a recurring theme. His his ex wife, who now we find out at the end of the program, he's reunited with in in their golden years. Uh, but they were apart for many years since the early 90s. She never liked it. She says, I never liked the business. I never wanted this. I never liked her attitude. And this whole goddamn, I'm usually sympathetic with every oh, come on. family member, except for who was the goddamn weirdo that, oh, that, uh, that Missy Matt, Beefcake. Well, no, no. The weirdo that Matt Bourne had hooked up with and oh, yeah. let him oh, fuck yeah. an OD or whatever. But the, Nurse Ratchet. Yes, <laughs> but normally I'm sympathetic to all the family members, and uh, but this fucking woman, I'd have I'd about had enough of her lip about three quarters of the way through this fucking program. Oh come because, on! No, because not only did she have a bossy attitude, but it, it, again, it was illustrated that when uh, I'm jumping ahead here, we'll go more chronologically. But at one point. Sarge is in the WWF and they go to the Poconos and I know where they're talking. They used to have wrestling at some of the resorts there every once in a while. And Sarge is working with the Iron Sheik and the wife who never goes and that takes the daughters who never go to wrestling and Sarge gets potatoed by the Sheik and busted open and he's bleeding. But they're now 40 years old. They're grown adults and these daughters are still crying about it. There's been a lot of... Uh, Bret Hart thought the Mongolian Stomper was killing his father when Stomper showed up at the house one day to get his check. Bret ran, ran and hid under the stairs. But they were children of wrestlers, and as they were smartened up to the business and grew up, th these girls were deeply affected by that, I don't think, by the incident as much, or maybe as more as by their mother's reaction to all this. You know, when well, well, when Sarge comes in and says, yeah, I'm going to turn heel and main event WrestleMania in front of 100,000 people at the L.A. Coliseum. Yeah, well, he believed it at least. She said, you're going to ruin our lives. It, I think she was a never liked the business to begin with and was informing their daughter's opinions on it. I never met this woman, obviously, because she never came to the fucking she he main evented WrestleMania. She didn't come and watch. Look, you have no idea what it's like to be both a wrestler's wife and a military man's wife. It's just double taxing 
on the person. Oh, now don't be a smart ass. Well, let me ask you this. The incident, as you talked about it earlier, because I hate to say I thought this. I love this documentary. I thought this was great. And I thought the family was wonderful. But when he talked about bleeding in that match with the Iron Sheik, how bad of a hard way would it have been to cause the amount of blood loss that they were talking about? Was it a hard way? Or was Sarge wrestling as he would, I guess, before an average Poconos audience? I don't know. What, 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 what do you Did mean? Sarge no, cut himself? Did Sarge do it intentionally? No, no, because it was a spot show at the Poconos. No. Not at that, at that period in time would they have... Now, Sheik may have been... Who knows? He may have been itchy to goddamn have some blood to get some heat to put up. But, uh, but no, it, it was probably a hard way. But at the same time, it also probably wasn't... a. It's 40 years later. It wasn't a ludicrous amount. It wasn't like the alley fight match with fucking Patterson amount of blood or whatever the fuck. But the, the daughter saw it, and you can tell the mother hated everything about wrestling. She wouldn't let him bring his fucking gimmicks in the house. He's living. She in, left in, him over the Iraqi sympathizer the, thing. Yes, and divorced him over the Iraqi angle. So I have no and, idea and how committed he was to all this. It makes me respect him so much more. Oh well, I'll tell you a couple of stories. But um, the the thing is, I was going to say is he's he still lives in Burlington, North Carolina. It's beautiful out there, the out in the woods in North Carolina, but home of. Burlington Industries, Burlington Coat Factory. You've heard of those people. Big textile area, but nevertheless. That's where it's from? Yeah. I thought it was from Burlington, Vermont. Nah, fuck Vermont. They know about coats. That's why I thought it was a coat factory. Oh, they know about textiles in the Carolinas. Um, but anyway, he's he's got a, you know, a regular nice house, but he's got no, none of his wrestling stuff in the house, I guess, because they're back together now. He's got tens of thousands of dollars of his original prize memorabilia and collectibles in tubs in a garage. So I just didn't like this woman. Love Sarge. Love Sarge. Didn't like this woman. It was nice to see, and I'm someone who collects Sarge and Slaughter figures. I love the fact that there are multiple kinds of figures across multiple toy lines in and out of wrestling. And he seemed to have everything. So here's someone who did save everything because I was looking at what he had there. It seemed like he kept at least one of everything. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's in tubs in his garage. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Vern got him booked in Vancouver and that's when he became beautiful Bobby Remus, which if you go and see that it's, it's ridiculous because he was not, he was it, not only was he not beautiful, which that's part of the heat, the heavenly bodies or whatever, you know, but it just wasn't him. He was doing a superstar Billy Graham because that's when Graham was so over in the AWA and it just didn't fit him. It wasn't his personality. And somebody had tweeted, well, so he was beautiful Bobby before Bobby Eaton. But if they, just to clarify, the original beautiful Bobby was Bob Harmon who was managed by the Grand Wizard in the WWWF and was also friends with Les Thatcher, and we brought him down to be a sports agent, Bob That's right. Harmon. That's right. To, <laughs> to represent Nature Boy Buddy Landell when he came back to Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Uh, but they had a lot of talking heads on, on this show, and they should have because everybody liked Sarge, but Gerald Briscoe and Greg Gagne, DiBiase, Hulk Hogan, Mick Foley, Shawn Michaels, Ricky Steamboat, Bob Costas, Bret Hart, and of course, the reliable Bruce Pritchard, which we'll get to here shortly. How unbearable is he? No matter what he says, it comes across as disingenuous and slimy. Don't make me jump ahead chronologically. So, he sees Sergeant Slaughter, that is, he, too many pronouns, pal, sees the D.I., the movie with Jack Webb, and got the idea and put it together. And they had some of the early pictures and everything when he was working on the gimmick. And I did not know that he got the name Sergeant Slaughter from another movie that was a Jackie Gleason character. As much as I love Gleason, I never saw that fucking movie. So there's a bit of trivia for you. There were a lot of things in this documentary. Again, I don't want to jump too much all over the place, but just about talent he discovered. There were a lot of things that I discovered in terms of brought them to Vince's attention. Yeah. There were a lot of things about Sergeant Slaughter I never knew before that I learned from this. 
And, uh, and you know, again, with his... I didn't know his, that, but I just figured his name was Bob. You know, the early stuff you see with him, you know, Sergeant Bob Slaughter. Yeah. Okay, he took the name Slaughter. What sounds more, you know, punishing than that? But that's, uh, you know, it, but it's a, an example here of when guys used to have ideas for a gimmick and be able to take them to a territory and, and try it out because he pitched it to Vern and Vern said, I love the idea. Go to Kansas city and do it. And that's what he did. And that was, and I didn't realize how long his break was uh, because Obviously, you know, in those days, I'm there's no home video, but I'm keeping up with like the the bulletins of the time that had the newspaper ads, and you see guys' names and etc. Um, and then the early newsletters and good old Terry Justice and his bulletins, you knew that um, there was a guy by that name in a territory or whatever, and then. What I didn't know was that his mother got cancer, and that's why he went back home to Minnesota and ran his father's company, and he was off wrestling for probably, what, about a couple of years, maybe? I'm not exactly sure how long, but this is when, and you know, you never really think about the timeline, he had already come up with Sergeant Slaughter. He was already doing an early version of that, and then he went back to Minnesota to be with his family, and then... Vern got him into the AWA, and that's when he became Super Destroyer Mark II, managed by Lord Alfred Hayes. Yeah, and and that's the thing that Sergeant Slaughter, he had done it in Kansas City, and Vern liked the gimmick, but he'd already had Super Destroyer, who was Don Jardine, right? That incarnation. Um, Scott Irwin. No, it wasn't Scott Irwin then, was it? It was, it was Jardine, because this was 1977 or 78. That was... I'll look this up. Check it up, but I, I, Jardine, that was Jardine's last run, was it not? As as either a spoiler or super destroyer. He had done both depending on the territory. Remember, he was super destroyer in the Carolinas. Or am I, do I have a brain tumor? I wouldn't call it that, but uh, I don't know what you have, but uh, maybe right that it wasn't Scott Irwin. Because super destroyer was Scott Irwin in Georgia. That's right. In the early 80s. But the point is they had an established guy in the territory in the AWA called the Super Destroyer under a mask. And whoever it was, we'll find out in a minute, Vern got sideways with him and he was gone and Vern needed a replacement. So rather than bring in a new gimmick to get over from scratch, he brought in another guy to put under an established gimmick and give him to the same manager, Lord Al Hayes. And that way with with Sarge wrestling in the AWA and Vern having a plane, he could get him home every night and they only worked 15 days a month. And he was able to spend time with his mom and he, and oh, and he told about the touching goodbye and et cetera. So that was that period of time where he stopped being Sergeant Slaughter just to go home. And, but that's how much, you know, uh, Vern was a big, a promoter at that time and to put him in a top spot after just a couple of years in the business that's how much they thought of his work at that point in time have we solved the jardine mystery yeah we have it was don jardine i have a little bit here from kfabememories.com of course kfabe memories is a part of arcadian vanguard this is from their awa history page uh 23 or number 23 page two by the way this all soon be in book form but anyway the next goal for the crusher was to unmask the Super Destroyer. Don Jardine had a disagreement behind the scenes with the AWA hierarchy about losing his mask and left the territory. The AWA announced on television that Crusher had unmasked the Super Destroyer on March 25, 1978, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and then... And and by the way, you know why? that Because Jardine had lost the mask early in his career when he first started being the spoiler, and it had killed whatever run he had going on. I can't remember what territory he was in. And Gary Hart, who managed him, told it, don't, don't ever lose the mask again. Remember, too, he had problems with uh, the Garden, because you couldn't have masked wrestlers on there until, what, 73? Yeah. So, but anyway, after Don Jardine abruptly left, Bob Remus came back to the AWA under a mask billed as the Super Destroyer Mark II one week after Jardine left. <laughs> Remus was a graduate of Vern Gagne's training camp in 1974. 
and had been on the AWA undercard at 74 and 75. So uh, while he was doing that, Pat Patterson was one of the top guys in the AWA in the ring still. This was when Pat was, you know, in the process of, of going to the WWWF first as a wrestler and then transitioning to announcing and working in the office or whatever. But he had told Pat about the Sergeant Slaughter gimmick and Pat took the pictures to Vince Sr. And of course they loved it and they brought him the first time to the WWF where he got over, you know, fairly quickly uh, as, as, as a top heel. And, you know, again, that's where he really wanted to stay for most of the rest of his career because he always got over in that territory and in that environment. And as we'll, we'll see in a minute, you know, he had to take the break from Vince for a while because he was making money. But the alley fight that they had the the highlights of, and they have to they have to turn the chroma down on the color when they have blood now, I guess, on on uh, A and E. Uh, but that match, think about this. It was at the time, and I have a real time reaction to it because we were we were hearing about things. This was when I was a fan, and I've told you the stories about going over to Weasel Dooley's in New Albany when he had early cable before Louisville got it, and you know, watching a couple of the Madison Square Garden shows, and we were like, "Well, fuck," because they weren't as good as the average show on Tuesday night in Louisville, and that was the style up there in New York at the time. They had great talent, but they had hard rings and they had short matches, and they they sold the sizzle, not steak, whatever simile you want to draw so we started i started driving the 40 mile round trip or whatever on saturdays to see the georgia show on tbs but it, it, still when that alley fight match happened it was so different it was sought after with the vhs tape traders it was completely different than the normal WWF style matches. It was like San Francisco meets the AWA and two of the best workers. And just the, you know, it could have been on an NWA program. And that was at the time it stood out and it really made Sarge, a, 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 one of the darlings of the, the smart fan set as small as it was back in those days. But think about this. He trained in 73, 74 and turned pro. But then, and then took a, a period of time off, but by 79 or 80, he's one of the best working big men in the business. So is it four or five years full time? He's, he's on top in Madison Square Garden. He's fucking tearing the house down. And then I got to see him some also when he first went to the Mid-Atlantic and started working for Crockett. And he fit right in with all of those guys because he could go. But, uh, I, I mean, you obviously as a, even though you're, you are, are too young to have seen that or been around real time, that's probably one of the first things you were, your attention was called to when you started trading tapes, wasn't it? Was the alley fight? The alley fight, there were certain things in the early eighties that in the early to mid nineties had like a, a lore around it. Tiger mask, dynamite kid. There were certain matches there. The alley fight match. Uh, Tiger Mask Dynamite Kid in the Garden, just because you want to talk about things that stood out because it was so different than everything else they ever saw there. The crowd reactions to that made it. But the alley fight was incredible, and I liked it better than uh, the Sheik Slaughter one in 85 or 84, which was a boot camp match. That was the second yeah. big bloody uh, Slaughter one because the garden was lit better and Slaughter came to the ring wearing white. Even though he was a heel, he wore white. Looking now, he's like, okay, he knew he was about to yeah. do something. But it was a level of violence you never saw in WWF. And Pat was such a tremendous worker. And all the time he spent in San Francisco working with the best talent. And that's where he got his booking mind from, you know, Roy Shire. And and Sarge was just, he was he was mobile in those years. But And that's the thing that, you know, they didn't show a lot of the mid-Atlantic uh, Crockett clips and everything, but he was uh, the 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 one thing that they they did make mention of him getting over the team of him and Don Cronodal, but they 
They skipped the Greensboro cage. I mean, a 16,000 plus seat sellout and enough uh, thousand people turned away to be able to get announced on radio. Don't go there and close the fucking interstate exit. Cause Starcade. And cause Starcade. And, you know, they skipped over that, but I know for the bigger picture. But they spent a lot of time on the, the, the Sergeant Slaughter limo, the camo limo. Do you know where that thing ended up? It may still be there. I don't know. I think you told me it was in the parking garage of Titan Tower. Titan Tower. I want to say it was sitting on a second floor in the in the garage because every time that I ever went to that uh, to the office, I would go in the entrance to the garage and you'd have to go around a couple of times to get to where we could park to go in the elevator easiest. And I would pass that thing. It had like four flat tires and it hadn't been washed in good God, I don't know, this was 96, 97, 98, 99, however many years, it had a layer of filth on it, but it was cool as shit, and I couldn't believe they didn't do something. Maybe now they've taken it to their one of their many warehouses and caves and labyrinths and caverns that they store their things in around the the area. But then they, they, they jumped into the, the Sheik and Sarge program, and making him a baby face. And that worked, you know, incredibly well. We talk about Jimmy Snuka being the hottest baby face they had in the, what, right before Hulk Hogan, but Slaughter was right before him, right? You know, it's it, even it, crazier. It was all at the same time. That's how hot things were. In early 84, right after Hulk Hogan won the title and he was the hottest thing in all of wrestling worldwide, you had. Sergeant Slaughter and the Sheik start up, which ends up being a multi-month major feud, putting Sergeant Slaughter in the talks. Is he the biggest star in the company? Even though Hogan had the title, there were talks. I mean, Slaughter was yeah. a big deal. At the same time, you have Snuka and Piper playing off the Snuka popularity of the year before with the best heel they had seen in forever. That lit things up. Hogan didn't have a feud. It was just Hulk Hogan coming to town against whatever heels there. Big John Studd, Nikolai Volkov, Iron Sheik. Didn't matter. There was no feud. It was just Hogan coming to town. That's how hot he was. He didn't need a program yet. And it plays into everything with Hasbro because it isn't just a wrestler got his own deal somewhere. It was one of the most popular wrestlers in the world who's up there with your champion who's been reliable and effective and all these things is trying to do something outside of Vince's outside of something Vince gets a cut of. Yeah. Because that was the, the thing Sarge was at that point, you could say uh, you could make a case. He was the, the most over baby face in the business and Hasbro wanted him for GI Joe. And Vince had the deal with LJN toys. And that's where <laughs> His wife says, well, I told him he could always be a wrestler. So he gave Vince his notice. And it was a good move. Yes, that it, it was it was a good move. Um, I'm glad she took credit for it. <laughs> but but that's the thing. He became for the next several years as part of G.I. Joe and wrestling, the huge merchandise, the TV commercials. He took Bob Costas to the Carnegie Deli in the fucking camouflage limo. And everybody knew who he was. And that, that's where he was showing he kept all his shit in the garage. I would have kept the wife in the garage because this stuff you is valuable. It. You know, the other thing oh. is he was so popular as they tried to do with Jimmy Snuka later, famously with Superfly C.V. Afi. <laughs> they just tried to replace him. And Corporal Kirshner ended up getting over with WWF fans briefly. It was a brief run. But that was a gimmick literally created just to... Sergeant Slaughter's gone. We need some sort of paramilitary we, guy. We need we need a serviceman. <laughs> Corporal Kirshner. I, you know, I thought he he did a better job when he hosted the rock concert, though, to be quite honest. No, that was Don Kirshner. Oh, uh, never mind. Corporal um, Kirshner. But Sarge at that point, he got big, he was big enough that he he could do indies and do his own schedule and merchandise. And then Vern at the time was. That's when Vern's business was kind of failing, so he would take any deal to get a star on television. So he said, hey, I'll just just do my TV. 
And so that way, Sarge got more family time and, and blah, blah, blah. Sarge, you thought our schedule was easy in the early 80s. Now you just got to come to Vegas once a month. Yeah. And uh, there'll be no people there, but you'll be on television, on ESPN. And Billy Robinson will be working in a hotel so you can go say hello to him. <laughs> but now here, here is the, lies the problem that a lot of wrestlers wouldn't... <sighs> Sarge had a unique opportunity there to be, you know, a star with GI Joe and national brand and blah, blah, blah. But a lot of guys would have been reticent to jump into that and to leave the spot with the biggest company in the world because of exactly what eventually happened in that Hasbro, you know, decided to go in a different direction. It took like five yeah. or six years or whatever. When did that happen? Coincidentally enough. Uh, well, during the the when w, when WWF got the Hasbro deal, because ah, they, well, they were with LJN okay. until eighty nine in nineteen ninety, they went with Hasbro. That's when Hasbro decided to move on from Sergeant Slaughter. Well, the point is that's what Vince, he said. How did Vince know? Vince called me up. I hear your your uh, toy deal's done. How did Vince oh, know yeah. that? Because <laughs> he had Hasbro. But the point is, when you're off television, you know, after five years. And Sarge being off TV, and now he's in his, what, mid-40s. And, you know, it, it's a start-over situation, it, it, you know, to because the, the, the big toy checks weren't coming. So Vince had him at a disadvantage, but he could put him back on television, and he pitched WrestleMania Seven with Hogan versus Sergeant Slaughter with Sarge as a heel. And that's when Vince gave him the the line, we're going to do the L.A. Coliseum, we're going to draw 100,000 people. And, of course, Sarge is, oh, my God, I could break all the records. I could be part of that. that you know, And that's where the, his wife said, you'll ruin all of our lives. So, Not but because of WrestleMania, though, but because of the Iraqi sympathizer thing. Well, yes, but... Uh, yeah. Anyway. And by the way, Vince screwed up. Because I was 10 years old, I was the prime audience, and when Sergeant Slaughter came in, off years of G.I. Joe, that thing was on yeah. every morning on like Channel 11. G.I. Joe, the toys were everywhere, brought him in as a heel. I think it would have been bigger if they brought him in as a babyface, had him turn on Hogan. As cheesy as that is, as simple as that is, the longtime babyface that you've seen on TV and on toy shelves comes in as a friend of the top babyface. Yeah. And then one day just, you know, close lines him, the Orndorf. That would have been more effective than you know, Sergeant Slaughter gives up on America. It, for a 10 year old, it wasn't the way I wanted to see it. Then it didn't. Not only did you know, it wasn't the way you want to see it, but you didn't really deep down believe it. Right. If it had, if it had been, if it had been more like a mega power state, which also, uh, this, uh, a lot of people don't give enough sunlight and highlight to the fact that this was Vince McMahon's biggest ever WrestleMania botch. If they had followed what they did with Hogan and Savage with Hogan and Slaughter becoming a super team, GI Joe and Hulk Hogan, real American, and then Slaughter turning on him for a personal issue. But Vince could not. Uh, now that in hindsight that I know him, I hadn't worked there then, but now that I know him, Vince could not control himself. He had the idea that, God damn it, this thing in Iraq is going on. And if he's, if Sergeant Slaughter, an American hero, is a sympathizer, and Hulk Hogan, my real American, can let, drop the leg on him and a blah, blah, blah. And he wasn't going to change it. As, and Bruce tried to justify the whole thing as not being Vince's ever biggest ever WrestleMania botch. Well, it was art imitating life. Well, it was shitty art. Nobody, not only the, I remember at the time, this was the year that I was setting up Smoky Mountain Wrestling, but I was in and out of Memphis and their business was the shits because the TV kept getting preempted for Gulf War shit. But it, it, people did not like this angle. They, like you said, they didn't want to see and didn't believe Sergeant Slaughter suddenly shows up and in the corniest ways possible vows allegiance to Saddam Hussein and General Adnan, and it's over the top. 
but the local sponsors didn't like it. The TV stations didn't like it. The WWF had to issue the statements, well, the views of Sergeant Slaughter do not represent ours or this station. And then Bruce wants to, or Bruce wants to, Vince wants to double down on it and put the belt on Sarge uh, over the warrior. And that's what Bruce said. Oh, shit. But uh, they still wouldn't give up on the thing when it, it it was obvious that nobody liked it. They showed a column by Steve Beverly. He was writing a column for several newspapers at that point. The guy that did Matt Watch. And everybody was calling it tasteless. And I remember fans' reaction. They didn't like it. So then that's where Sarge's wife said that Vince called her directly and, and told her, well, we've had some death threats and they got him 24 seven security. And Sarge was loving it because he loved the heat. And then Bruce tries to bury Jesse Ventura for the idea. They had to burn the American flag. Sarge wouldn't do it, but they burned Hogan's t-shirt. Yeah, that's weird for a couple of reasons. One, Jesse left in like August of 90. Yeah. So I got to look at the timeline and see if that makes sense. But the second thing is what Sergeant Slaughter did in 84, the end of 84, going to G.I. Joe, this was right when Jesse had the falling out with Vince because he signed his own video game deal with Sega. And Vince went crazy and said, you can't do it. And Jesse said, you know, the hell I can't. And Vince fired him, causing Jesse to sue him and win. So, Jesse Ventura, another guy that tried to do his own deal, just like Sergeant Slaughter. But anyway, regardless of whose idea it was, Sarge wouldn't do that. But the whole thing, I'm writing at this point, he had an incredible career, and we're, we've spent over 30 minutes on a flop angle. And so then Vince has to tell Sarge, well, we've canceled the Coliseum, we're moving indoors to the sports arena, and he blamed bomb threats. And it sure was a bomb. It, it was a threat of a bomb. All right. But not a bomb threat. They, they would have had the sports arena crowd in a hundred thousand seat stadium. They admitted in this program that when they made the decision to move indoors in February for a late March show, they'd sold 12,000 tickets and they didn't sell that many more. I don't think, uh, they, they, they sold out at 16,000 but they were trying to do 100,000. And again, Bruce had to say, well, this has been known since it happened. The poor advance and the poor re reception that the angle got was being reported on and everything at the time, all the insider newsletters and a lot of the newspapers in general. That Bruce still says, well, there were several reasons. Now, ticket sales weren't going well, but the biggest reason was the cost of security. We didn't want somebody making a statement at our event in the L.A. Coliseum and a bomb. You know, and, and the cost of securing the Coliseum, it wouldn't have cost that much because they would have been able to shoot deer in the balcony because there wouldn't have been anybody in it. We could secure the arena easier. Of course you could. But if you had been able to sell 70,000 more tickets you probably would have been able to pay for the security guards. I think security would have had an easy job. There would have been so many empty sections of no one sitting anywhere. Yes. They would have been able to spot anything outrageous. But unless maybe as part of the pre-show security protocol, they were instructed to look under every empty seat. Now that could have taken a while. I swear, Bruce is like the fucking usher for the Vince McMahon library. <laughs> it's like taking you on a tour and just feeding you this bullshit. You know, you could see why Ronda said he's Vince's avatar. Vince has him say what Vince would say and justify what Vince would justify. And Bruce comes across as completely disingenuous and just someone you wouldn't want around who's just slimy and, and dirty and just, I don't well, know. No, I'm, he's, I'll tell you what, he's meticulously clean as a person. As a human being, I'm not talking about in terms of the derma. I'm talking about the deep derma. inside. I'm talking deep inside the person. <laughs> well, deep down inside where the the derm is dermer. All right. Uh, but so then the, region, the reason 
that Sarge did all this and turned on his country and, and you know, became an Iraqi sympathizer was to draw 100,000 people, and now he's at the L.A. sports arena doing, drawing crowds. He's, he's done that. And did that remind you of, in those days, thankfully this has changed. They still do celebrities in the WWE, but all the cheesy celebrities at WrestleMania, you were reminded, even D-list, F-list, Z list. Favors. No, because it had, and they even showed, it, I think, for a second, Regis, who's a pretty big star. He was on well, TV yeah. every day. Alex Trebek, beloved host of Jeopardy on TV every day. In between them, Marla Maples, famous oh, for yeah. having an affair with Donald Trump. Famous for fucking the most disreputable, repugnant human being on earth. You know, and I got to say one thing Donald Trump is a trendsetter. When you see footage of WrestleMania 4 and 5 and here at 7, him sitting dead center right in the front row. He watches everything, so you think he's interested, but he reacts to nothing. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't move. He doesn't clap. He doesn't... <laughs> it, like, you can tell he's watching. He's not falling asleep, but he re it's like a modern fan. I think he, he started the modern fan. <laughs> well, no, he's learning how to con the gullible suckers. <laughs> but anyway, so... Sarge loses at WrestleMania to Hogan. Did the stiff boot to the face I'd never noticed before. But that's why he main evented WrestleMania. His wife didn't watch it. His daughters were scared that they'd hear that he'd been killed. And I again, I wrote, who was reinforcing this idea, I wonder? Because, yes, you hear, you know, everybody's war stories, but you don't see a lot of other heels kids crying about shit that happened 40 years ago. Uh, is it, you know, well, let me ask you this. I mean, again, it's a different world now than the fifties or whatever, in terms of smartening up your family. If a wrestler brings their family to a show and one of the children has a reaction like that, should the parents just come out and say, it's, you know, these are friends with your dad. They're not real. Don't worry. Nothing. You have nothing to worry about. Everything's okay. Or should they, you know, my God, what will he do next week? Well, well no, it, 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 it depends on the kids and the age and the circumstance. And even if, even if somebody has a real accident and is really hurt, the other parent should always be wanting to tell the kid, no, it's okay. He's going to be all right. Well, you know, he's a tough, whatever. Instead of, oh my God, his liver's falling out. But you didn't want to tell young children because they might be tempted if they're getting picked on in school to tell uh, the other kids, well, no, my dad could whip so-and-so. It's just that he's told not to or whatever the case. Uh, but, uh, you know, you have to tell that this is daddy's eye. What do boxers say? Or what do uh, hockey players or football players? You have to say those kind of things. It's a, it's a professional sport. Your daddy's tough. He might be getting beat up, but he's going to beat the other guy up too. But, I mean, these people were traumatized. I think it was the wife's, the way the wife was selling what was going on at the time. I'd have my kids sitting ringside every time they didn't do their chores. And just, I'd be, oh, God, oh. Just, yeah, see what's going to happen? All I needed it, you to do is take out the trash. Yeah, pick up the dog <laughs> shit, and Daddy won't be getting kicked in the balls. <laughs> but anyway, um, so... That's where we go to, you know, by the early 90s, he's becoming an agent. He was great to work with. He did appearances as an ambassador for the company, he did the commissioner stuff, and got to work through the Attitude Era with some of those guys and help them, and occasionally would get back in the ring and do a special match or take a couple bumps, and his, his shit still looked good. And at least his daughters like seeing him inducted in the Hall of Fame. And then it, right at the end of the program, they co re covered the the scandal or the blowback or whatever. He got heat for saying he was in the Marines when he wasn't in the Marines. And I guess on, what was it, the podcast, the Jim Norton asked him, well, yeah, I did two tours of Vietnam. Two tours, 68 to yeah. 74. But he said it wasn't Bob Remus, it was Sergeant Slaughter. But that's the thing. I served with a man named Manny Fernandez. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, but he apologizes and he was working his gimmick and he means it. He never wanted to just impersonate a serviceman or a law enforcement officer or some kind of official person for nefarious means. It was a gimmick he came up with and the boys all told him and taught him, you work your gimmick. You tell people 
that you are real. And did people go too far with that shit with the whole, you know, Sergeant Slaughter's stolen valor. He's stealing credit. Mm. He doesn't deserve it. He's a, uh, you know, people went crazy over this. Yeah, that's it. If you come out and you say, yeah, as a matter of fact, I got dropped from a helicopter, saved fucking four guys' lives, killed 18 Vietnamese people, and then fucking, uh, you know, prevented the battleship from sinking. I deserve a medal, and it's bullshit. I have 30 but, kills. Fuck yeah, fuck you. But if it's just, if your gimmick is that you're, it was Jack Webb in the DI? Was he guilty of stolen valor because he was playing the thing on on the in the movie he didn't break character in the movie in wrestling your movie is 24 7 that's you we need more people with this dedication today we wouldn't be in the bad shape we're in but um but i'm glad to see that he's hanging out a lot at his fish pond and still does fan fests and appearances and uh, i wish he'd bring his memorabilia in the house and put it up on shelves where he can look at it all right, well, there it is, the Sergeant Slaughter biography. I was impressed by the fact that he had all of his stuff, that he had everything from his collection. I'm a little distracted. I was looking for a promo here, Jim. Here's one of the early clues that Sergeant Slaughter may not have been in the military. Are you ready for this? Okay. Here's Dr. D. David Schultz. Gotta see him Monday, June the 4th. Come on in, Dr. David Schultz, if you would, please. Notwithstanding the big match between the Iron Sheik and Sergeant Slaughter, you've got a crack at the former Marine prior to that out at the Cape Cod Coliseum. You know, I'd give anything in the world to get my hands on him before the Sheik got his hands on him. You're going to do it. Because after the Sheik gets his hands on you, boy, or after I get my hands on you, ain't nobody going to want you anymore. We're going to make mince meat out of you, boy. We're going to make dog meat out of you. We're going to beat you up so bad. And you're talking about combat boots in Vietnam. I never seen a soldier in my life while I was in <laughs> Vietnam wear steel toed combat boots, you idiot. <laughs> it rains a lot there. You're a goof. You ain't got everything upstairs. But Cape Cod, wherever that is, oh. I'll get there. You know, I've got a good friend. I'll friend of mine who lives out there. I don't care if your whole family what? lives there. I don't Where care if your I... mama lives there. I don't care if your daddy and your mama lives there together. I don't care if your mama lives with another man there. I want Sergeant Slaughter there. And I don't care if you bring your mama with you, Sergeant Slaughter. I'll slap her like a dog. <laughs> and I don't care if you bring your daddy. I'll beat him like a dog. Now, see, I just don't care. You know what I mean? I believe there's an now attitude problem bring your problem family there, with yes. you. I believe you've got the problem. I don't have You look problem. like you got a problem. You're I... getting thin on the head. You're ugly. I don't like you. You got a bad, uh, what you call it, manners. You and Sarge might be kin. You both might be from Cape Cod. So just bring the whole family and line them up, because I'd like to slap about 15 or 20 of them plum silly I... after I get through with you, Sergeant Slaughter. Thank you very much, Dr. David Schultz. Outspoken. You're welcome. Well, there it is, Jim, but... Steel told boots in Vietnam. It rains a lot there. <laughs> it rains a lot over there. <laughs> oh, and that's actually that's a a, a good look at uh, what it's like to talk to David Schultz. Also, that's a local promo. That was a local promo for TV, and it was amazing. Trying to slap Sergeant Slaughter's mom and dad. <laughs> but but you know what? They needed some writers. They needed some writers. Oh come on. Well, how's anybody going to believe it without writers? Well, there it is. Sergeant Slaughter. I thought it was a very, very well done documentary. I could see, maybe not to the degree that you feel it, why you feel what you feel about the wife. And uh, someone should have just talked to the kid and said, calm down. He'll be home for supper. Yeah. But uh, a good documentary there. Jim, before we go to the next thing we have to talk about, I think what we need to talk about is a good meal. A good meal. Well, have you got any suggestions? You're going to take me out to a restaurant? You're going to spend a lot of money to pay a chef to fix up some meal for me and serve it to me nice and hot and ready to eat? How much is that going to cost you, Brian? Well, That's I'm, going to cost you a fortune. It and would, it, but I'm not going to do those things. Well, and how do I know that these meals are approved by a dietitian and I'm getting all of my my vegetables and my minerals and my my calories and all the things that I'm supposed to get in the proper uh, portions per day. 
How do how do we how do we factor all that in? That's going to cost a fortune, isn't it? It won't cost a fortune with factor. Well, that's because we're factoring these things in. Folks, if you'd like to factor yourself into some delicious restaurant-quality meals that are ready to heat and eat whenever you are and wherever you are, well, then you need to go to the folks at Factor Meals. That's what we've been doing because, you know, in this hurry-scurry world, the hustle and bustle of modern society, Brian, how often do you have time to shop and prepare and cook and eat and then clean up after the meals over and over again while you're out busy earning a living for you and the children. I don't have any time. I wish I had time to cook for everyone, but I don't have the time. No, and your wife doesn't have the time because she's busy caring for all those children that you have. And the children, they don't have the time because the last time they tried to cook dinner, it burned the last manor to the ground. It's not true. If you're if you're not going to let these these underage uh, miners operate heavy equipment and potentially use kerosene and be involved in flames and fires and noxious gases, then your wife and you out there in in podcast land, you're so busy earning a living with your various jobs and enterprises that you just don't have time to do the shopping and the cooking and the eating and the preparing and the cleaning and all that stuff. Factor is going to fix it for you. No prep, no mess meals, ready to heat and eat. Now you can put them in the microwave or you can put them in the oven or you can hold them over a campfire. As a matter of fact, I don't even care if you run run a candle underneath them a couple of times because you like your meat rare. The meals are fixed right up for you and they're ready to go in just two minutes. You got 35 different options to choose from every week. Calorie smart, protein plus, keto, the... As a matter of fact, here's some of the ones that we got here at Castle Cornet. I've got this documentation right here. We got the roasted garlic chicken with green beans and sour cream and onion mashed potatoes. It's right there in the container. You just heat it up. Red pepper queso chicken with brown rice, parmesan, and sun-dried tomato chicken penny with roasted green beans and pearl onions. (laughs) What are you laughing at? It's no, no, penny, not penny. Penny. That's what it says. Penny. <laughs> tomato, sun-dried tomato chicken penny. With roasted green beans and pearl onions. Pearl, pearl, pearl. Don't give your love to Earl. I can give you diamond rings. I can give you fancy things. I'm telling you, folks, at Factor, you're going to get food that, well, anybody would eat if you stuck it in front of them. And there's more than anyone 60. would eat if they could pick good, wonderful chef crafted food without having the chef crafted prices. Yes, because if you go out to a place and have this, the chef craft these recipes and the Craft. dietitian approve them, Craft. that's what I said. Yeah. Well, it'll cost you a fortune. But if you use factor meals and their chef who's crafting these things and their dietitian, he's a guy named Phil. He's a heck of a fella. Phil. Phil. Phil the dietitian. Well, then, then they're going to they're gonna package everything up and send it right to your door. You don't have to go out in public. You don't have to risk getting ill or killed in a car wreck or robbed or shot in this country. It's going to come right to your door. You heat it up when you want it. They got the add-ons, pancakes, smoothies, easy options for the entire day, midday bites, breakfast, all kinds of stuff. So if you're looking for fast premium options with no cooking required, just heating, they will do the rest, and it's less expensive than takeout and or going and actually getting it on the premises, and it's nutritious and delicious. Go to factormeals.com slash JCE50 and use the code JCE50. You're going to get 50% off, so you're trying this stuff at half price. I mean, for heaven's sake, if you don't like it, feed it to the dog. If you're getting it for half price, you're down to the fucking price of Alpo anyway, aren't you? So just try it and see what happens. Factormeals.com slash JCE50 and get 50% off. It's half price. You can literally get some of this sun-dried tomato chicken penny. Well, you're only going to pay for half of it. That's right. Penny, like Mercedes Monet, not Mercedes Money. 
you're going to pay a penne for the chicken penne. <laughs> no, every time you eat some of this, you're only paying for half of it. Keep that in mind. Factormeals.com. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Yes. Factormeals.com. What's that promo code, Jim? JCE50. That's right, Jim. Factor, and we love them here in the house, and uh, I really like the one that I got the other day. I like them out in the yard, too. Grilled they're, chicken. They're, sweet they're good pota- either way. Well, I had one the other day. Grilled chicken, sweet potato, mashed potatoes, sweet potato, mashed potatoes. Sweet potato mash, I guess I would just say. <laughs> or what else would say? Sweet potato mash with corn and rice, and it was delicious, and more of that. Yes, yes. Sweet potato, mashed potato, Haas and Pfeffer Incorporated. Well, Jim, speaking about potatoes... Sammy Guevara was suspended this past week from AEW. <laughs> we had just talked about the incident where he dove onto Jeff Hardy's face. Any thoughts on this? And at what point? I mean, how many times are you going to get suspended? I guess he is like their Randy Orton. I don't know what it is. What do you he's, think? About I think all this? he's he's their Buddy Landell at this point. He's going to have to pay <laughs> installments on the fine. No, he's not getting fined. He's getting suspended. I, I they haven't said suspended without pay, so I assume that means he goes home and gets his check in the mail that nobody knows about while he's not visible to the fans, so that they can actually make the case from AEW management that he's being punished. But he's not. He wasn't suspended for the face diving. He was suspended for after he dove and landed on Hardy's face. He picked him up and gave him his finish and dropped him on his head again. The Moxie special. (laughs) Trademark. But I... I, 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 How... What in the world? And the only reason that that Tony did anything about this such as he did was because people were like, how the fuck do you let the guy jump up and land on Jeff Hardy's face and blah, blah, blah. It's a PR thing, but also again, he wasn't suspended for being so off the mark and doing something he didn't, didn't need to be doing anyway that he caved the guy's face in. He's suspended for picking him up. Why did the referee not just call for the bell? Remember, Matt Hardy was at ringside. Remember after the match, he got in there and him and Sammy were yelling at each other. It looked yeah, like. but that's what I'm saying. When you see something like that, the fucking referee call for the bell. Like in, in, in a working way, when guys used to do pile drive or try to go for pile drivers in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, when we brought guys in that may not have known, you know, that the pile driver was illegal. I would tell Brian Hildebrand, Mark Curtis, or any of the other referees, stop them for a shoot. Tell them, I got to disqualify you if you do this. So the referee does have powers and responsibilities far beyond that immortal man. He could have said, oh, shit, you just caved his face in. I'm calling it. Don't pick him up and drop him on his head. Again, if it's... You know, one of the, a star on pay per view or whatever the fuck, and they call okay, small package, roll up, or you know, Owen Hart found a way to allow Austin to recover long enough to just fall backwards over Steve and and let Steve pin him when Steve was paralyzed, but he didn't think okay. If I'm going to go over, well, the first thing I'll do is pick this paralyzed guy up and drop him again. Some common sense has to go in here. So <laughs> when it comes to referees in AEW, there's a lot of flashes, not a lot of Mark Curtis's. Oh, very good. And uh, I don't know, Daryl Morris. He was a good man in his own right. He just didn't get too much experience. But that's, a, I mean, everybody except Jeff, who was just laying there minding his own business. <laughs> is it fault in this? <laughs> he just... He just laying there like this fucking stupid goofy kid is gonna fucking do a triple Lindy off the top rope and allegedly land on me in a safe manner. I'll just stay right here. He was knocked so silly afterwards. He said I wasn't even there. Yeah, it was it was Owen. But but yeah, it's a token suspension to do something in a PR fashion for an ongoing problem, and nobody said he's gonna be penalized in any way. Otherwise, he doesn't have to travel to the towns and work to get his check. And again, what about the referee? What about who? Where is Tony? Is Tony not on Gorilla? I thought Tony was on Gorilla, where he could be afeared of his life on a regular 
basis when people is, yell at him. Is Gorilla a new methamphetamine? No, at the oh. gorilla position. Oh, of course. of course. Couldn't he have done something like, they've just brain damaged Jeff, stop the match. Tell him, no, stop. But so what? But now, it, and, and the first thought in Sammy's mind is, oh, I've really hurt this motherfucker, so we got to go to the finish instantly where I pick him up and drop him on his head. None of this makes any sense, but you're dealing with people that are not in their right minds before they even get landed on. And, it, you know, we talk about the wrestler's dream. Isn't the wrestler's dream to get suspended with pay to go home to their wife and newborn baby? Yes, or any kind of babies between the ages of 18 and 35. Uh, but it, I, I did 300, let me say, hold on here. Yeah, I did 300 approximately episodes, weekly one-hour episodes of Ohio Valley Wrestling in a training school with the future generation of WWE stars and others. And I'm trying to remember a TV match that we ever had to stop because of injury. I mean, there may have been, okay... Five matches per show, 300 shows. There might have been one. I'm trying. I'm struggling. Linda Miles. Did she injure someone? No, no. She just injured the people's feelings. <laughs> That's what was the matter with her matches. Um, guys got hurt. We had some injuries in training. Matt Capitelli got a concussion in training. That's why he had a CAT scan and they found his brain tumor. I mean, things happen. It's, it's sport. But I'm trying to remember... I did 200 one-hour episodes of Smoky Mountain Wrestling that any match ever had to be stopped because of energy. Energy. Injury. In we stopped all the matches that had energy in them. Um, it, it, but this is constant now. It's because they're doing shit that doesn't apply in the job description, and they, they not only don't know how to do it, but when they do know how to do it, you still can't control that shit. It's too risky for no rational reward but then but then but then to be irresponsible on top of it after you've hurt somebody to go well I better put this one away quick let me give him a high impact move what yeah see that's the thing the decision to continue on with the finish is the problem everyone seems to have sammy Guevara does all these moves these you know twisting tumble salts in the air I have to think it's really hard to master how you're going to land when you're spinning like that. Well, and the thing is, you don't just have to master how you're going to land, but you have to master where exactly yeah. you're going to land to land in the right place. You can protect yourself, fine, but it's harder to protect the person you're landing on. Anyone could be a heart surgeon. You know, anyone could just fucking cut someone <laughs> open and operate on their chest. <laughs> But to actually fucking pinpoint the exact... Someone once compared it to me. They said, being a heart surgeon is like jumping across the room and landing on a dime. That's what it is. And maybe some of the, these moves are just not made to be done without the guarantee that someone's not going to be fucking concussed. Hey, here's the... Whether it's brain surgery or heart surgery, it's a lot easier to take son of a bitch back out than it is to put it back in. Ask Shibata. Well, it wasn't his heart. It was his brain. Brain, heart, same thing. Well, it's not the same thing. One's in the head, one's in the center of the chest. Well, I mean the surgery of these things. It's harder to put them back in than it is to get them out to begin with. Hey, Chris Nowinski's on TV. Analysis shows main mass shooter had traumatic brain injury. So here's Nowinski on TV in a tie. Talking right. about people with injured brains. Talking about people... Right now, as we are talking about is this Jeff, Jeff Hardy, Hardy going to be the next mass shooter? Oh, that's not even funny. Why would you say that? Well, he, that's not even all, remotely funny. It's all going to be Sammy Guevara's fault, apparently, if he's the one that gave him the CTE. Let's just worry about him being a mass driver. Let's not even worry about anything with firearms right. or anything else. But what do you do with Sammy Guevara? Talented guy. He's been there five years. We don't know. I mean, I guess you could argue maybe he's hit his ceiling. He's one of their pillars. But what does that really mean? <laughs> But what do you do with him if someone who, in the past, has, there's been issues where he's either caused fights or not done anything to cause the fights not to happen, maybe directly caused the fights to happen. <laughs> also, the potential of 
not taking care of your opponent. And that's what this is all about. If you're it, stiff with it, someone, they're supposed to know it and they're supposed to be okay with it. It's not just, and this isn't even stiff. It's, you're not supposed to just no, land on someone's just, face. <laughs> see, that that's the whole thing is with a lot of these guys, one of the reasons why I keep saying AEW is doing them no favors is because they're putting them in these guys have never been on television. They've never been in a, a alleged major company. They've been on the indies. They've been on the the niche products of the wrestling business. And for them to now come into this situation where they're on national television and they're making this amount of money and they're in front of at least a lot of people for them at this stage of their careers, they're thinking this is normal, that this is acceptable behavior, that this is the way the wrestling business is, it conducted inside and outside the ring, backstage and in front of the camera. They do, they're not being told the truth that this whole company of AEW is an anomaly that has a lot of fucking problems because everybody wants to be rah-rah instead of, you know, and, and so the point is Sammy has, is probably, hopefully not, but he's probably been convinced that he's a star, his shit doesn't stink, they're all doing the right thing, and they're just being unfair to him, or whatever the fuck, and he's learned a lot of bad habits. Whatever the bad habits are, these guys that only have an AEW experience, when they get out of the indies, they're learning them. And if they ever get a chance to go to the WWE, or if any other real major promotion ever comes along that is run professionally and has standards, these guys will be at a disadvantage because they didn't go to a developmental program to teach them how to be wrestlers. They went to a developmental program to tell them that they're fucking stars and their shit don't stink. And it's hard to unlearn that. Let's go, Jim, to another big topic here. And I have an article here from the New York Post. We'll get to uh, some quotes here, but Paul Heyman <laughs> being elected by that notorious elected. by that notorious voting body, being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. And boy, howdy, people are like, oh, Jim, you've got to uh, induct him. You've got to know uh, that I'm sure that there's somebody <laughs> that Paul would think is more instrumental in his career than our little skirmishes we had 35 years ago, but. I'm in fully in favor of this. I think he's incredible. I I don't have any qualms whatsoever in saying that Paul Heyman should go in the WWE Hall of Fame for his work over the last couple of years, if nothing else. Um, I, I am less inclined to... Uh, a lot of the people are saying, oh, because of ECW, Philadelphia, it's perfect. I think ECW, all in all is probably one of Paul's minor accomplishments because, you know, to be honest, Smoky Mountain Wrestling now, with 40 years hindsight, is one of my minor accomplishments, and I didn't lose nearly as much money as Paul did on ECW. But he's been a fucking fantastic promo and a booker who can get the most out of the least and who has incredible patience for dealing with bullshit and to get what he wants. And he's a politician in the, you know, uh, in the murky world of wrestling for all of that. I think, yeah, I mean, my God, when, well, I'm not trying to give anything away, but the other announcements have been made is bull Nakano. I'm, that's like, let's put Frank Sinatra in while we're at it. Yes. I know she worked there 40 years ago, but, Heyman has she been... Worked, she you, everything now is 40 years ago. She worked there in the mid-90s. Or whatever it was, 30 years ago. See, I'm so old, I can't keep track of time. But I'm saying, if, if Bull Nakano was uh, was in, inducted to the Japanese Re Women's Wrestling Hall of Fame, she'd be first ballot, obviously, and she probably has been if they have one. But compared to her going to the WWE Hall of Fame, Heyman is a no-brainer. He's, you know, he's perfect. As I said... No-brainer, Shibata. Well, come on now. Just for his work the past few years, but he's always been a great promo. He's done good booking work there, even if I wasn't an ECW fan and it was a giant money loser. 
Um, he also did good work in his days with the Dangerous Alliance and etc. So, yes, I'm I'm proud of him for going in the Hall of Fame. I'm wondering if he's going to go on a weight loss program to lose a chin or two by the time he has to give the speech. Well, there it is. For no good reason, you have to once again malign this man. But you said ECW was just a blip or just a minor part of it. In a sense, it is because if you think about those photos of him as a kid, 12, 13, whatever he was, interviewing wrestlers, interviewing wrestlers at the Garden, his dream was to always be where he is now. Yes. That was, you know, like... To be honest, my dream was always to be, and I never got to do this, I wanted to be on top in Memphis when business was great, but my timing was bad. He always wanted to be on top in the garden, because he went there as a kid. And and he idolized those three heel managers. Yeah, and he was able to to do that. And, you know, and I, if I say a blip, I'm being kind with ECW, because you do have to blame Paul for the furniture the tables, all the bullshit that they did that then, you know, people, again, as everything in wrestling that gets over to some level, people with less talent, less sense, shit stain and others, then take somebody else's ideas and prostitute them to the point where it just causes a problem instead of making any impact. So I got to blame Paul for furniture with ECW, but good and bad otherwise than that, he's had a spectacular career. That's right. Good and bad, highly influential. Uh, do I dare did ask? You, did you see? Did you see Bubba Ray tweeted out? Yeah, Paul's going to get his award. And Paul, here's your. We're sending your award via FedEx. Here's the tracking number. Dot dot dot. Because <laughs> Bubba was the tra- the FedEx tracking number story. He was the guy Paul was talking to when he called him and said, "Paul, I got no ticket. I got no. T- I can't get to the show. Where's my plane ticket?" And Paul says, oh, uh, I FedExed it. Here's the tracking number. Boom, 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 boom. And Bubba says, that's too many numbers. And Paul said, oh, just take the last one off. Well, I have some so- quotes here <laughs> from the uh, New York Post, an article oh. by Ryan Glassspiegel. Is that one of Paul's nom de plumes? He had a few. There were a few different things that were sent into the wrestling news. I have a giant Paul Heyman file from just when he was <laughs> operating his wrestling enterprise out of his parents' house. And there are a lot of names attached to photos and articles that read like Paul and seem to be using Paul's camera. And yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. He definitely made it seem like he had a big staff for uh, his operation. But Jim, here's a quote from this article. It's taken me all these decades to figure this business out and the art of presentation to an audience. So while I hate to use the old cliche of you ain't seen nothing yet, and I'm just getting started. You ain't seen nothing yet, and I'm just getting started. I don't want a Lifetime Achievement Award when I'm not done achieving things. I still have a lot of other work I want to do in this industry. I want to be involved in the first main event of WrestleMania in Havana, or on the moon, or on Mars when Elon Musk colonizes it. These are things that are going to happen in the future, and I desperately want to be a part of it. Let me stop there. Any thoughts on that? Well, look, but Paul has perfected the art of speaking in grandiose and glorious and uplifting terms about, you know, whatever the fuck. He's, he can sell anything to anybody. And then how he's, I, I want to achieve. I want to move forward. That's a, it's a positive sounding thing. Whereas I'd be going, fuck you, the fucking moon when they told me Germany, fuck you, I'll go home for I'll go to fucking Germany. Get on a goddamn plane to death tube. Uh, but Paul loves to talk in those grand and glorious terms, and it's part of his innate appeal. He also revealed in this uh, conversation with the Post that he has turned down the honor several times because he thought he still had a lot of runway left in the wrestling business. Still had a lot of running away left. It is a little weird when you get inducted into a Hall of Fame and you're still active. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, I can see for a, for a professional athlete, for a wrestler, but someone in the managing or uh, some ancillary capacity that's not uh, d- dependent on their prime athletic years, 
if a guy's 70 years old and he's still producing something for that particular genre that the Hall of Fame involves, should he be barred until he's a goddamn senile? He can't tell he's in it. That's true. Although that's a question. Although Heyman doesn't have to worry about CTE. He never took a bump in his life. <laughs> well, <that's... laughs> Got you there. That's the thing is the, the most of, of damage that Paul has done to his body is carrying around an excess 180 pounds of fucking weight. So he'll be around for a while. I have no doubt, but yes, that's why he's still so clear in his speaking and his, his conversational and con man abilities and his ability to talk a goddamn person into doing most anything. Well, Jim, speaking of people who uh, have an ability to say things, <laughs> if, if, that, if that's a way to set something up, Hulk Hogan's in the news again. Oh boy. He has several quotes and from quickly uh, asking you about it before the show, I've determined you know nothing about any of this, so I'm not going to say anything no, else really it, about it. it. The only thing that I've, they had the nine lives of Hulk Hogan program on vice, which was not produced or under the auspices of our friends at dark side of the ring. It was some outlaw production and they had a bunch of nitwits that like wrote Hogan's book and have uh, talked to Hogan in conversation as the talking heads who were reporting that yeah he slammed the giant when the giant was almost 700 pounds and a lot of people don't know he tore all the muscles out of his back and all that so it was just complete hogwash so that's the only thing I've seen lately related to the Hulk Hogan war on truth what has happened now Hulk Hogan did an interview with Praise on TBN. I'm guessing Praise is the name of the program, and TBN is the religious network. I'm going to assume the, the, the bullshit network. Well, I don't think it's that. It must be the Bible network, if I had to guess here. It doesn't really spell it out anywhere on this uh, page. Let me see. If I click more. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That Trinity Broadcast Network. I oh. bet you that's it because a bunch of those religious con artists were on that back in the 90s before people started seeing through everything and it kind of went underground. All right. Well, uh, on the air since 1973, TBN's flagship ministry and talk show Praise is one of the most recognizable and watched Christian programs in the world. That's like being the nicest guy in prison. It's hosted by Matt and Laurie Crouch. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> I just <laughs> I can see him opening every program with a deep knee bend. Where are the crouches? It's tape before a live audience, but Hulk Hogan recently appeared on the show. How many how many shows do you know tape before a dead audience? We're gonna play uh one of the chapters here entitled Hulk in Hollywood. But here oh, are boy. some of the other chapters just to uh maybe we'll play some more. Baptized in Christ, the impact of Hulk's career. Chasing a Dream, Becoming Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant's Mentorship, Hulk in Hollywood, In the Ring with Rocky, Hulk's Relationship with His Parents, Wrestlers Finding Faith, God's Guiding Hand, Sky Hogan's Testimony, that's his, <laughs> new, that's his new wife, the, uh, I believe she was a Scientologist, the power of influence. Oh, well, wait a minute. And the Scientologists, they're supposed to be mad at these other other folks, aren't they? I'm not exactly sure what is happening. Because they don't they don't believe they don't believe in God. They believe in a space alien uh that L. Ron Hubbard talked to once. The power of influence, the road to baptism, leads which of course leads to the big baptism pay-per-view. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Revival in America. <laughs> Revival in America. The Immortal Hulk Hogan. Moving forward in faith. A prayer from Hulk. Handsome Ron Howard. Whoa! Oh, wait a minute. Ron Howard gets a gimmick now? Has he got bleach blonde hair? He's bald, but it says handsome Ron Howard. Maybe we'll play some of this audio as well. <sighs> Connecting with Hulk's pastor. The importance of baptism. What's next for Hulk Hogan? And that's it. But let's Jesus, was he on there for five hours? I'm not exactly sure. And that's, so it, he's gone headfirst into the whole religion thing now because he can't 
wrestle anymore and he, he's uh, you know got enough artificial body parts he's gone to yet another offshoot of a business where they will believe any kind of bullshit story as long as you present it with personality well we shall see let's hear him talk about his career in hollywood or i guess maybe the career that could have been Hey, you went on, you know, conquering the wrestling game, we could say, but, you know, making that move into Hollywood, into acting, and that's another kind of dog-eat-dog world. You know, the wrestling game is a dog-eat-dog world, kind of cutthroat at times, for sure. How was that transition into that whole new kind of arena, film and TV, new challenges? Well, it was a logical extension of where I should go with my career. Yeah because once the wrestling took off and the character Hulk Hogan became as big as the wrestling business at the time, um, people were reaching out to me, you know, to do other projects, commercials, Super Bowl commercials, right guard commercials, all kind of stuff. And <laughs> the movies were- Why are you laughing? I, I just find it funny that people say, you gotta do deodorant commercials. You gotta, <laughs> you've got a smell about you. See, I'm wondering as I'm watching him here, he has a, you know, obviously it's a very religious interview. He's wearing all black with a black shirt that says John 316. Devotional team, believe, with a cross. He's also wearing a cross around his neck. Black do-rag. But is it like a Sergeant Slaughter situation? Like, as soon as I put the do-rag on and leave the house, I'm Hulk Hogan. Anything I say is about the character of Hulk Hogan. There's no, he did that in court. He said Hulk Hogan has a giant penis. Terry Bollea doesn't. Yeah, yeah. He said that. He said, yeah, there's difference in the size. Well, I think it also he's got the cross on. So he's Hulk Hogan is a religious figure, whereas Terry Bollea just wants to know how can I fucking get over my bullshit with a different crowd. This is just him trying to buddy up to the Young Bucks to get into AEW. But let's go back to this audio here. We're a logical extension. So um, Vince McMahon and I sat down and basically spent three days over on Madeira Beach writing No Holds Barred. And then we brought a writer in to clean it up, and he pretty much got all the credit for it because we didn't know anything about writing or the Screen Actors Guild. The, the, movie, the movie would reflect that assessment as correct. Yeah, go back and watch that movie, and there's also phrases that you never hear in any other movie, like, jockass! Like just weird things that only Vince McMahon would say. Him and Hogan were in a room together for three days writing that script. What else was in that room for three days? The power of them to write that script. The writer cleaned it up and got the credit for it. Have you seen the screenwriter <laughs> of No Holes Barred out there say, I wrote that, I wrote that, I want the credit. Well, the writers go, we didn't know anything. We hired a writer to clean it up. We didn't know he was going to own it, which it, it didn't matter. But once I made that film and it was successful... Um, New Line Cinema wanted me to make more films. And the problem I had with it was I loved wrestling so much, and I was yeah. in the prime of my career. It wasn't like oh, I was on no. the, the downside, no. and I was picking up extra work or trying to get out of the wrestling business and become an actor. I was in, I was the world's heavyweight champion. Hulk mm -hmm. was running wild, and I was in front of 20, 30,000 people every night. Now you want me to go no! sit in a Winnebago? on the side of the Sony soundstage for 14 hours, and you might call me at 5 o'clock to get in front of the camera for five minutes. The process was hard, and so I always wanted to go back to wrestling, and I did, but I kept bouncing back and forth, making small, low-budget movies for kids and having fun with that, you know, and shooting them in 25 to 30 days and running right back to the wrestling business, you know. Let me stop it here for a second. He was making every movie that would have him in it. <laughs> is what he was doing. <laughs> Nobody that had an offer from a major Hollywood studio to do real movies would have made any of the movies that Hulk Hogan was in, would they? Well, he also had a good cameo in Gremlins 2. That's a good movie. That's a good well, movie. But I'm the starring, I'm talking about a Hulk Hogan movie rather than, oh, there's Hulk Hogan over in like a Hitchcock cameo. Well, Mr. Nanny must have been a taxing role on him. I mean, he wore a tutu, I think, in the uh, film. <laughs> And, uh, of course, Suburban Commando, playing a uh, commando from outer space who lives in <laughs> suburbia with Christopher Lloyd. That, um, that must have been a taxing role, too, and all those That's other ones. Saying, can you imagine any of the th roles that he might have turned down if he made those were the ones he made? I can't, but let's go back to the Hulkster. And I had the chance to become 
like the next John Wayne, the this guy named Bob Evans that ran, ran yeah, Paramount. Hold up, pump the brakes. Off. Did he say he had the chance to be the next John Wayne? That's right, Pilgrim, brother. Okay, before we go back to this <laughs> conversation, which I'm interested to see hear the follow-up to this. <laughs> What what year was No Holes Barred made, which was the first starring role were, for Hogan? Rocky, Rocky three with the Thunderlips part. That was what nineteen eighty two three, right? Right. It came out in eighty two, I believe. No Holds Barred came out in eighty nine, the summer of eighty nine. Okay, so he's talking to these movie people about being anything in the late eighties, eighty nine ish. They wanted him to be the next John Wayne, the Cowboys. The shootest were in the early 70s. The next John Wayne was Clint Eastwood. John Wayne had been over for 15 fucking years. Right? Right. I mean, he died. <laughs> Too, that was yes, one of those things. Yes, that's what John yeah. Wayne had been done. He's finished. He's, he's in the archives for no. 15 years. The next John Wayne well, was Clint Eastwood. The spot was already taken. Timeline wise, too, though, you have to remember this is the era of the action hero. You had Schwarzenegger, you had Stallone, you had Jean Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal. Not very often do you see a skinny Jewish man do Hakito, but what a star he was in those early films. Die Hard, Bruce Willis, let alone some of the B films like American Ninja and stuff. It was the era of those films. Obviously, no John Wayne type roles. <laughs> But maybe he would have had some of these Stallone or Schwarzenegger roles if he had really tried. They wanted to remake The Quiet Man with Hulk Hogan. Well, let's go back to... Uh... How about North to Alaska? North to Alaska, you go north, the rush is on. George turned to Sam with his gold in his hand. Said, Sam, you're a-looking at a lonely, lonely man. I'd trade all the gold. That's buried in this land for one small band of gold to place on sweet little Jenny's hand. Jesus Christ! Because a man needs a woman, mush, to love him all the time, mush. Remember, Sam, a true love is so hard to find. I'd build for my Jenny a honeymoon home below that old white mountain, just a little southeast Jeez, of I Nome, in there where the river. All right, come on, come on, come on, come on. Big nuggets they're finding. You can't sing this north long uninterrupted. To Alaska, you go north. The rush is on. Way up north, mush. Way up north, mush. The background singers only had to do mush all day. All right, well, let's go mush and let's go south to Clearwater and finish with Hulk Hogan. Oh, yeah, what's Hulk saying about John Wayne? And Robert Evans. Office, and there was a big picture on the wall with Clint Eastwood and John Wayne and all the big stars, Dustin Hoffman and everybody that was mm -hmm. part of the contract players for Paramount at the time. <clears throat> and he said, you're going to be my next John Wayne. Wow. And then he kind of like laid out the schedule and what was expected of me. Um, on and off camera, I went, eh, I'm the wrong guy for that stuff. So, oh, goddamn. Um, I just uh, decided to go back to wrestling. and Yeah. Many people would have jumped at that, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're talking about... <laughs> Who do you? <laughs> if, if some major studio executive had said to Hulk Hogan in 1989, I'm going to make you the biggest movie star in Hollywood, as long as you cut your penis off with a dull fishing knife and hand it to me right now, then Hulk wouldn't have had to testify in court about the size of his dick. Well, speaking of Hulk's dick, let's go to Ron Howard. We've talked about him in the past. <laughs> We've never actually heard his voice or him in real action. Uh, where is now, he? Now, this apparently is Ron Howard, the manager and major domo of Hogan's Beach Shop down there that not only tries to push the autographed one-of-a-kind world championship belts that they sell there, but also is a noted... COVID denier, conspiracy theorist, and right-wing lunatic. Apparently so, because it opens with a shot of the uh, beach hut, or the beach shack, whatever the name of the store the beach is. beach shack. That's a love shack, <laughs> baby. All right, hold on. Before you, I, the last thing we need is you sing of the B-52s. What, what is the picture be a disaster. Of, the there of, of the beach shack there? It's a, it's a shop on a street near the beach in Florida. Let's go there now. 
Now, folks, we can't come to Clearwater and hang out with the Hulkster without visiting Hulk Hogan's wrestling shop. Let me pause it for of, a second. A lot of music, a lot of music. A lot of music, a lot of loud music, so this may not, we'll see how much of this could get on YouTube, but uh, we're trying, folks. One of the guys that makes it happen is my best friend, handsome Ron. Come here, Ron. Come on in, Ron. <laughs> this is, I'm going to throw him in the middle, in the middle. The run in. But he's a believer, and he brought me so close and just made things work for me when I just really couldn't quite get there. So iron sharpens iron. That's his favorite statement. And he's a lot of the reason I'm where I'm at today. Talk about your walk. And, and as Hulk said, he's got sky in his life, of course. He's got the Holy Spirit. But you really played a pivotal role here. God put you in his life playing a pivotal role in taking him to where he is now, getting baptized, and all these great things going on. Holy, Holy crap! <laughs> so it's Ron Howard now Hogan's head first into religion because of this lunatic that believes everything under the sun. I like how his wife's name is Sky. So he's like, Hulky, now of Sky, you have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you have land, you have sea, you have air. Hold on, let's go to. You have the spirit in the sky. We well, said that we're going to go gonna... when I die. Do something big, you know, it was more than just these shops and making money. And, you know, it was about doing fun things and loving people and caring for people and getting out in the community and doing good things. Well, this is, um, I believe this is just the beginning. It is. Um, it is. This it's... is the beginning of a new season. And um, I'm so excited and so blessed and grateful and humble to be right where I'm at right now. Um, and I, he, he says it all the time. Um, you know, we're right where when you're walking with the Lord, and you're walking with the Holy Spirit um, and you're staying in line with the Holy Spirit. You're right where you're supposed to be. You think you need to rush out and you, you you're running around. You might think you're late for something. But when you're walking with the Holy Spirit, you're right where you're supposed to be. And if you get a little bit sidetracked because things come up, I, did, I, I failed miserably yesterday. I did in my heart. I can I can I got so much conviction now. <laughs> But what I went and I repented saying? and I turned. <laughs> How did he fail yesterday? What did Ooh. he do? <laughs> and by the way, next time someone goes in there and he acts like a dick to them, ask him if he's following the Holy Spirit at that moment. Yeah. That'll shut him up. Learn from those evil thoughts and things that have been put in my mind all these years of the way I grew up and, and things like that. And I'm now becoming, and Hulk says this, who I'm supposed to be. You know, we're now finally becoming who we're supposed to be. And this is who you're supposed to be, brother. Holy Take care of my shop and collect my money. This is who you're can supposed you, to be. <laughs> can you see how these people can be easily persuaded? I'm just, I'm just asking you. Can you see how whether it be the religious crowd, the conspiracy theorists, these are the type of people who are easily convinced of things? He seems uh, like a very unique person. Mm-hmm. Hulk Hogan's awkwardly standing next to him, doesn't know what to do. This guy's just talking for two minutes straight about all this, and Hulk doesn't know where to look, what to do. It's really kind of funny. What was the, what was the failure, by the way? Again, was it? Uh, did he have an impure thought? I had a failure yesterday. I slept with a bunch of hookers. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, what is it? And it's Florida. Yeah, there was a bunch of crack. I had to smoke it. Let's go back to Ron Howard. Um, this walk is amazing. And when you do get a little sidetrack, you just jump back on the tracks. It's okay. You ask for forgiveness and jump back on the track. And little by little by little, those things get less and less and less. And your life, life just becomes easier. Your relationships with people, with your wives, with your family and things and people. With your wives. With your, <laughs> your, your, your well, he's a Mormon on top of everything. <laughs> Did, uh, is this the deal where these people believe that you can apologize to a fictitious, invisible being that you believe in instead of apologizing to real people in the world that you have pissed off or wronged in some kind of way. You don't have to go through that trouble. Just apologize in your mind and it's okay. Unfortunately, Ron Howard doesn't really seem to be giving any details about what he did, who he upset, what he had to apologize for, nothing. We got to find that he ran over someone. It was just a hobo, but you know. Well, hobos have rights, too. They got in the way of my path, so I ran them down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this walk I'm on. <laughs> All right, well, there it is. Uh, Hulk Hogan on Praise on TBN, hosted by the Crouches. <laughs> Any uh, final thoughts? <laughs> Thank you. If he became a wrestler, old Mr. Crouch, when he goes up to the top and they kick his legs out from under him and he lands on the top turnbuckle, the announcer can say, by God, they've crouched Crouch. I like the idea he's talking about Robert Evans, who ran Paramount, left Paramount, 
got busted in a drug scandal. They made a great documentary about him using his own words from his audiobook years ago. The kid stays in the picture. Yeah. And then eventually, in the early 90s, I believe they gave him an office at Paramount, but he wasn't running anything. He was just there with a production deal. Like, he produced Sliver, or whatever that Sharon Stone movie was, and a few other things. So the idea that at that point in time, you know, Hulk has nothing to do on the set. He's like, Hulkster, come here. You know, come in here. You'll be the next Dustin Huffman. <laughs> and Hulk's like, yeah, I can't drop my schedule. I can't stop making a couple million dollars to make these dozens of millions of dollars. I just couldn't do it. There wasn't enough time in the day, even flying back from Japan. It was quick, but we are in the future, Jim. Shh. We, we did, oh, come on now. We didn't need that. That was totally unnecessary. We did not need to time travel. D tell the people the truth. I just, I had to wee wee. We've just been gone three minutes for how I could have taken a running start and broad jumped into the future. There was no need to rev up the, the time machine. You just like making the noise. You got a good broad jump? You got a good vertical leap? I've, 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 in my younger day, I don't want to hurt myself now. I could strain my milk, as Mama Cornette used to say, if I made any sudden moves or tried to lurch myself off the ground. But if I got a, a real good head start at it, I could, I could leap over things. All right, well, we leapt yeah. into the future. I guess that's yeah. the point. And here we are, and it's your show. No, it's not. We are still on my show, <laughs> whether it's the past or the future. But I'll tell you what, Jim, let's talk about wrestling's past. Always a depressing time of year. The oh, return no. of Dark Side of the Ring. No, come on. Now, don't Looking at darkness like everywhere they could find it. No. In every nook and cranny of the wrestling business. They're there with a flashlight that they will turn off as soon as they spot any darkness to capture the darkness. And they return with another sad and dark episode. You Looking at a wonderful man who had a very sad story they told with the most dramatic and sad music they could find. Uh, <sighs> dark Side of the Rings back, Jim. Looking at Jesus, it sounds like uh, Husney, Husney and Eisner, proctologists. They've got the, the flashlight going into the dark crevices to find the... Dark sides of things. No, I, I... I can't wait for the reenactment of someone stubbing their toe. Oh, come on. They're looking for things to reenact now at this point. They're just looking for anything they can... Well, Why don't we do this? They, there weren't cameras up everybody's ass in those days. See, now there's footage of everything. <laughs> but you got to reenact some of these things because everybody didn't have a camera up their ass back in those days. And we're making light here, but it was, it was a... You have to admit... I told you ahead of time, because I saw it before you did, it was Earthquake John Tenta was the season premiere, and I told you it was so sad. And then when I spoke to you after you'd seen it, you agreed with me. that it, and, and it wasn't, it's a, a kinder, gentler episode of Dark Side of the Ring, in that in a lot of cases, the subject or principal person being profiled, or however you want to phrase it, is uh, uh, of somewhat uh, of their own making they had troubles they there, there's some culpability people could say well you know in some aspects so and so brought such and such on themselves but john tenta was a wonderful guy of uh, great talent for the time that he had in the business and you know, what a family the family is just the the daughter and the sons and the wife just you fall in love with them. So it was a it was even though it was a sad ending, obviously, because he passed away early of cancer, it was still it, it was it, it, he deserved his story told and for these wonderful people to get a chance to be on television. Now take the piss out of it. it okay. Sound like a big prick. I thought it was great to hear Earthquake's story here. I'm Brian Last. <laughs> I'm the co-host of Jim Cornette Experience. And I also really thought that it was a nice story. Let me go to another person who's going to do their introduction right now. And this, sometimes it's just nonstop introductions of people. I'm Jake the Snake Roberts, 
Everyone knows who the fuck I am. Everyone knows who these people are, but whatever. I, oh, there goes my phone. <laughs> people are calling, people are texting, multiple people. Everything's blowing up, which has nothing to do with Dark Side of the Ring. Um, the question was there. It was asked. Yes. What was the question? <laughs> no, uh, I'm not going to take the piss out of the whole thing. Look, I'm not a fan of their production style and some of the choices they make. But in terms of story, it was a nice story to hear. And, you know, it's nice. He was a really memorable character from the moment he debuted. And they immediately got him away from the Ultimate Warrior for one reason or another. <laughs> he was a memorable character for people my age growing up. And it is sad when you see all the WCW stuff laid out. I just, you couldn't yeah. call him Earthquake. Avalanches, eh, I mean, almost acceptable. The Shark, no. I mean, that one promo I remember ever since I was a kid. I'm not a shark. I'm not a fish. <laughs> like, rarely as a wrestler had to deny that they were a fish. Yes. On television. Well, but at least that was still better than Golga. We, we'll get we'll, oh. we'll that in a second. But the point is, and and by the way, yes, I know you you are are too much of a factitious uh, uh, fanatic to enjoy the reenactments and the hazy murkiness and et cetera, et cetera. But one of these days, they'll be reenacting me and you. And they'll just have to put a big fucking blob up because nobody will know what you look like. So it'll be one of those blurred fucking... Then they can reenact when they get served. <laughs> Bop! Yep, that's how we'll do it. Anyway, back to John Tenta. No, I thought he was a wonderful guy. I got to work with him some in the WWF in that period of time in the early mid-90s and late 90s, unfortunately, Golga, but he was still a, a wonderful person. And the one thing that I had never realized, and I just, I guess if I'd seen it in print, I didn't pay attention, being around him and seeing him from the time, you know, we got the, I got the Japanese tapes in the, in the 80s, so I saw him when and he debuted to a lot of fanfare over there because of his sumo background. I was getting the magazines. I didn't realize I'm older than he was. Because he, he not only he was one of those guys, a wrestler of the old days where he looked older than he was, but also he went bald or balding in the front or however you phrase it prematurely. I'm not trying to denigrate him. But, and, and just being so fucking big, you know, you were like, oh, he's a kid next to me standing here at six foot seven or whatever the fuck. But I'm like two years older than him. I did not know that. But I thought they did a good job for the, you know, the basically American audience that knows him mostly from WWF and then some WCW of telling the story of him in Japan because. You weren't around at, concurrently in real time, as the kids say, but he was a, a he made a lot of news when he transitioned from sumo to pro wrestling in Japan. He was a big deal in the magazines, and so uh, the tape traders, smart fans, newsletter readers, such as they were at the time, and nerds like myself, you know, already knew who he was, and then we had heard that they did the you know what, about a year and a half later, they did the fan in the stands intro that for him. Awesome. Would he, you know, That was so good, because you know what? I was watching that as it happened on Saturday morning. Uh, I think it was Saturday morning. I don't think it was Wrestling Challenge on Superstars. And Ultimate Warrior was the biggest thing. And he's just coming off defeating Rick Rude and getting his title back. Even as a kid, as a nine-year-old, I'm like, oh no, please don't do him feuding with Dino Bravo. Like It just, <laughs> sound, just sounded awful. Like I was nine and I knew that somehow. And they did the fan in the stand stand. It was the perfect building to do it in because you could almost see right up the stairs to him. Like, and he wasn't in the spotlight or anything. He stood out. Yeah. And as a kid, I remember thinking, oh, that guy. It has to be that guy. And he had the perfect, like, bashful fan reaction. And then he turned on the warrior. Well, because he had that face with the, the cheeks where he would like to smile and he was a happy guy. So he could look, you know, menacing, but he, he normally he looked cheerful but were they in west virginia because they announced him john or whatever from west virginia um you know maybe so yeah i think if they were in the wheeling civic center that that building seems like that may, but nevertheless and they bring him in that way but then boom he's a heel and he's with jimmy hart and that kind of illustrated he had only been a pro 
at that point in time for like what not even two years and all in japan but and at that size almost 400 pounds even when he was younger six foot seven he could move it around and he could work kind of i'm not saying he wasn't doing you know fucking hip tosses and you know exchanging arm drags with people but he could work kind of naturally innately especially for a guy that sized where he could do his shit and do it safely and at a top level early on in his career yeah hogan wouldn't have been working a feud with him if he couldn't work safely no no especially at that fucking weight that wouldn't work for him brother and he picked guys like that that could work so that was a testimonial there but um you know that's that's the thing is that was a memorable run from what was it? I think we just said 87 to what, 91 or 92? What? In, the, in WWF, you mean? Yes. He started in autumn of 1989. And oh, God, I'm sorry. I said 87. Yeah. And then I know he was there in 94, but I think he left in between for a little bit. Yeah. He, he had, after the deal, the natural disasters with Thai food, who <laughs> he's, he's going to be on every episode See, in some fashion or another. Is there's an example. He was great. His story was great. This is the sad story of John Tedder. They just had to take a whole sidetrack just because they wanted to do the Shockmaster. Yeah, well, I <laughs> to do a whole big thing on that, which did not fit in the John Tenta story. Do that story. Well, but that's like in the middle of real time when when Bill Maher does the the comedy bit. You know, <laughs> they took it just for a second. We'll and then we'll get back to the serious discussion. But anyway, yes, he then left and, and came back for a while, I think because he left and went back to Japan for a year or so. Because then the second when he came back, that's when, you know, I first got to work with him up there. But nevertheless, uh, you know, unfortunately, even though he was a young guy, his time at, at, at the top was fairly brief. He's so memorable. But he's one of these guys people don't realize you know, how short a time period it actually was, because they think he may have always been around somewhere. And, you know, that's that was a shame because, you know, I I don't want to... When, when they brought him back in, whatever, 97 or 98, Golga, he was part of the oddities, and Shitstain was in love with the Howard Stern show, so they'd bring the weirdos to be with the oddities, and they were fucking having Tourette's all over the place. I I get the idea, Vince. I didn't know why because I said, "Well, here's this guy that can do this." You certainly something else besides put him in a hood and dress him like a fucking mental patient. Just being earthquake th would have had some value. Well, yeah, but I think Vince wanted Vince McMahon wanted to give him a job because he liked him and you know for past glory or you know fucking contributions or whatever. But he didn't really have any thought or effort of pushing him for whatever reason <laughs> and, and and i was out of that picture by that point so i was not prying because it would require me to be around shit stain even more yeah it's so weird when you think about the attitude hour you never think about the fact that earthquake was there yes and he's under a, a fucking goofy mask and a goddamn set of pajamas with a cartman doll yeah which was briefly like the new doink the clown on the indie scene there were plenty of bootleg <laughs> golgas all over the place. <laughs> Golg. There and then boy, did you ever see the the women's version, Golga My Ear? <laughs> but anyway, so <laughs> thank you folks. Tip the waitress, and I'll be here twice on Friday. Um But back to John. But again, you know, WCW, he floated back and forth. They made the shark and the fucking whatever the remember they also made Big Boss Man turned into the Guardian Angel. They just were just not only morally but creatively bankrupt over there. And it's a shame that he didn't get, again, you know, more opportunities at the top because of that period of time in the business. Do you think the Boss Man should have just gone back to being Big Bubba Rogers right away? Well, it, I don't know why that that wasn't the first thing on everybody's mind. And I... Uh, I think Bubba would, would have been fine with that, but I think the creative brain trust, blah, 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 whatever the fuck, they didn't, they kept trying to play off the uh, WWF gimmick in some law enforcement capacity instead of going back to what he had established on their own television network 
a mere, what, you know, four years previous, but I, I digress. But yeah, and then, the, you know, they told a story, and, and we're going to have uh, an interview with Evan Husney on the experience this coming week about all the various episodes in season five, but they told a story about, you know, him getting out of wrestling, and he was driving a truck and or selling clothes at the big and tall men's store, which I guess he would have, he should have been a spokesman. But I think he was a quiet guy and, you know, didn't rock too many boats and didn't go to the doctor to have something checked out until it was very late in the process. It turned out to be cancer. But Hey, the, uh, just, Co the Koji Kateo match, what do you remember about oh, seeing it and hearing about it? Because you obviously were in the business. Um, well, and I was reading the... The rudimentary printed newsletters of the day, back when we all saw in black and white. What was that? 30 years ago, 32 years ago, 1992, I think. And it was a big deal that, uh, and you probably can help me out more on the details, but it was a co-promotion that WWF had agreed to with SWS, which was, I'm going to say, Super World Sports. Was that that's it? That's right. Yes, right. And yeah. it was, there was a big, heavy-hitting Optish, optical company uh, of some description involved in bankrolling the Tenaru was involved. Help me. Yes, uh, it was actually the original version of AEW. A billionaire's <laughs> son. No, a, uh, a very rich man started a company and it was a big deal because he stole Tenru. I say yeah. stole. He got Tenru from all Japan, which caused a whole chain of events to happen, which led to the elevation of Misawa a little earlier maybe than it was going to happen because they needed to get some guys in place because Tenru was gone. Well, and, there you go. And they had to deal with WWF. That's why Tenru was at WrestleMania 7 and the Royal Rumble and various things. He did like 20 minutes in the Royal Rumble once. Tenru, you yep. never saw him ever. And all of a sudden, 20 minutes in the Rumble. Because you had to think that now Vince may have seen his in into expanding or taking over the Japanese market with this Mark money mark that's um you know whatever will be nice to them and and how long did sws last do you remember uh it lasted for a little couple of years a few years remember it was tenru and koji katao against demolition they beat demolition at wrestlemania 7 in la oh my god that's right and if it wasn't for the price of security that would have been at the sports arena so i mean imagine what a big deal for the japanese press that would have been <laughs> Um, uh, but nevertheless, yeah, that, it kinda, Koji Katao and Tenta, Katao is another one of these guys. He, he I, I guess he probably prayed at the altar of Akira Maeda. He was disgusted with the Americanization and of wrestling and, and the fact that he was an ex sumo guy who had attained a high level. And here was Tenta who did a year or two and, he was getting put over and didn't want to do the job because it wasn't real and blah, blah, blah. All those various things that were going on in Japan during that era. And, you know, so they, he quit cooperating, whatever the fuck, and, and it broke down into, all right, Tenta said, come on, and, and Katow doing the fucking double Stooges eye poke motion, like, I'm going to poke, and he tried to poke him in the eyes, and Tenta blocked it and tried to kick him in the nuts. And Katow apparently decided at that moment he thought better of it because this motherfucker looks menacing and we don't really know. And he got out and got on the microphone and told everybody wrestling's fake and Tenta was a fucking cheater and stormed out and never wrestled again. He was used to being the biggest guy. He wasn't the biggest guy in there with Tenta. Yeah. And he was used to being a big deal in sumo and assumed it was going to be that way and and apart from this match which degenerated and caused his early demise in the japanese wrestling business he wasn't getting rave reviews up to that point was he he was was he another like another wajima oh well i wouldn't i wouldn't eh. I was about to say I wouldn't do that to anyone, but he no, he sucked really bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and he was even worse at MMA. Uh, yeah, he was really bad. He did not work. He was a, I'd say a flash in the pan, but that may not even be the right word. But in and out quick, did not get it at all, but had this memorable moment, so we still talk about him. Yeah, so anyway, when that happened, it obviously spread back to the WWF locker room first because a bunch of the guys were there. 
and then it was in the sheets and spreading around the various territories. But yeah, the fucking earthquake had a shoot with a Japanese, you know, fucking martial arts guy or whatever the fuck they were calling him back then. And, uh, you know, that, but I think everybody in the business already knew you probably wouldn't want to just try to fuck John around in the ring at his size and with his background. He had been an amateur wrestling champion and, you know, uh, played legitimate sports and done sumo and blah, blah, blah. So nobody already thought he was a, you know, fucking pushover. But uh, but anyway, it, it, it was a nice episode for once to, even though it was a sad story, you fall in love with the family. They're so, you know, just charming in every way. And it was nice to hear his story told because a lot of people didn't know a lot of these things. and. Also, it was a uh, it, it, it was a dark side, but it was not of the person's own fault or making. So you got that going for you every once in a while. All right. Well, dark side of the ring had nothing to do with the dark side Maybe of the it, ring. It was it was, <laughs> it was it was there was the gray side of the ring. What do you think of Jericho as the narrator? Um. Well, at least we don't have to look at him. He's got the perfect face for radio. Uh, and, uh, and a perfect you know, he, voice to poke out he, your eardrums with an ice pick. He de- well, he does a good job of reading what's what's jotted down for him. But uh, oh yeah, it's you know if uh, I will be uh, I've lost my notes. But t- Tuesday nights at ten o'clock Eastern on Vice TV, I'll be coming up in the next few weeks uh, with some some wonderful pithy commentary on a particular subject. And of course, that subject would be a, a wonderful. Will be wonderful. Yes. And potentially, you'd want to call someone and tell them about it. So call somebody with Mint Mobile. Well, what you got to do is you got to get on your Mint Mobile and you got to call somebody and you got to tell them that Jim Cornette's going to be on the television. But if you don't have the Mint Mobile, Ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. TV announcer, if you don't have the Mint Mobile, then you're going to be up shit creek without a paddle. Have you ever thought, Brian, about why the heck, with all the things that they can do with the space age technology these days, that your wireless bill, your your cellular phone, the thing that you communicate with, or that most people do, of course, everybody knows I'm against them, but nevertheless, I'm losing that battle. Why is it so gall darn expensive? Because it's ready. They they transmit television signals through the air, and you can pick them up with these newfangled antennas they got for free. It's 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 radio waves. It's 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 light and sound that travels through the air. Why does it have to be so gosh dang expensive? I'll tell you why, Brian. Last. That's because all these big companies got together. The ones that are putting up the towers all over the place that are beaming signals into your brains on a constant basis. They decided, yeah, these people pay a hundred bucks a month, maybe 125, maybe 150, but mid mobile. Oh no, no. You know what they're going to do? They're going to say, Oh, contraire mon frere. And they're going to say, we can send you these signals that go through the existing air waves and light waves. And we can do it for only $15 a month. That's because it's probably not really costing anything, but at least Mint Mobile ain't fucking you as bad as these other people are fucking you. And they're building their towers They're not fucking you. They're not fucking you at all. And well, they're, they and they're not building anything. Head. They're just building relationships with the consumer by delivering wonderful service. Well, see, they don't have these big towers that stick straight up in the air. It costs a fortune to build them. See, they're building their shit on the ground. That way you don't have to bring in the big heavy equipment. They just start and go sideways. They are and on the ground. that way it's 100 feet long instead of 100 feet high. It's cheaper to build. And then they just beam the signal right out the top, right to your phone. They are on the ground working with the people. The, yes. The people of America, the common man. <laughs> And delivering great phone service. So let me reiterate that once again with a great price. Yeah, what well, did I mention that? Starting at $15 a month, you can have a wireless plan and you can get wires if you pay a little more. That is unlimited talk and text plus data. 
for $15 a month. And I'm, so there you've got the talking ability, you've got the texting ability, and you got the, the data ability. And it's, it's premium wireless. It says so right here in the copy. And all the plans come with the, the high-speed data. It's not even just data. They get it to you quick. You tell them what you want, boom, it's high speed coming right back at you. Well, here's your data. And you can choose from a three, a six, or a 12-month plan and say goodbye to a monthly phone bill. And hello to a three or a six or a 12-month phone bill. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or whether if you're expecting a baby, you know, all babies have to have phones. And they've got special now prenatal phones where you can buy them, they're waterproof, and you can pop them no, right no, Hey, No, you can't. They do not have that. They will not have that. I thought that way the kids get practice. That's not the way the kids get practice, and you probably, ladies and gentlemen, shouldn't have your kids on a cell phone too young could develop some bad habits. They got to be at least 18 months. Well, at Mint Mobile, family start at two lines. That's one for, for mom and one for dad. Then you can add one for the divorce attorney. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. If you want to still use that probably germ-infested thing you keep in your ass all the time, right? Right, so You're sitting on it, constantly farting at it. But, you yes. know, if, if you don't want a new one, it's up to you. And you can switch to Mint Mobile right now and get your first three months of premium wireless service starting at just $15 a month right now. Here's how you do it. You will go to mintmobile.com slash JCE to get your new wireless plan for $15 a month to get the plan shipped to your door for free. You don't even have to pay for somebody to bring it over to you. If you go to mintmobile.com slash JCE, cut the wireless bill, cut the wire on the wireless bill and, and save a stamp while you're at it and, and save a horse, ride a cowboy. Mintmobile.com slash JCE and just pop that thing right up there. Don't do that, but check out Mint Mobile, friends of the show. They can be friends of yours. Mint Mobile, what's that promo code one more time? Jim. Slash JCE. That's right. If only. If only. <sighs> well, Jim, let's move on here with this wonderful show that's going so well. And your audio sounds good uh, for the second half, I must say. We have an article here from Deadline. Deadline. It sounds serious. <laughs> Vince McMahon... Oh, boy. Quote, is not coming back to the company. <laughs> TKO and Endeavor exec Mark Shapiro affirms after former WWE boss sells another $412 million in stock. <sighs> Any thoughts on that very long headline? <laughs> what do you think if another 400 and whatever million dollars, do you think he's putting together a fund for future... NDA hush money payments, or is he gonna is he gonna have a money bin built like Scrooge? Mc, he'll be Scrooge McMahon, and he'll be diving around in his one billion dollars in cash. Is he gonna be like Granny Clampett, go down to the fucking Commerce Bank with a wheelbarrow, say, load up my billion? I want to roll around in it. You have to think he's gonna do something. You don't make yourself that liquid. And uh, do nothing. Watch you make yourself. It sounds like he's been consuming the wrong kind of liquids. Ah, <sighs> piss. But uh, let's go to this oh, article here. For sake. I, I'm sorry. That's the wrong uh, person I'm thinking of. Uh, this article by Dade Hayes. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you see, it's not even funny. You already made it. It's, An article by Dade Hayes. Dade Hayes. The that's brother right. of Daisy Hayes, apparently. Vince McMahon, the ex-WWE impresario who abruptly left parent company TKO Group Holdings board in the wake of a graphic sexual abuse lawsuit, is not coming back to the company, TKO President Mark Shapiro affirmed Wednesday. Speaking at a conference in San Francisco, hosted by the Wall Street firm Morgan Stanley, Shapiro said TKO did not participate in the recent... Uh, this is an actual quote, did not participate in the recent sale of Vince McMahon's load that he dropped off. 
<laughs> Why is that? Why the I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, is but why that, is that appropriate <laughs> verbiage? Couldn't he have taken another grammatical route that would not have led him down that path, considering the allegations which have been levied against the former chairman? But read it from the top again. So we get the continuity. Speaking at a conference in San Francisco... Hosted by the Wall Street firm Morgan Stanley, Shapiro said TKO, here's a quote, did not participate in the recent sale of Vince McMahon's load that he dropped off. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, he was referring to McMahon's decision, revealed Monday in an SEC filing. To sell $412 million in TKO stock. The company was formed last fall as a holding entity for the WWE and UFC, controlled by Endeavor. Shapiro said the most recent stock sale cut McMahon's holdings to 15 million shares. He had sold an even bigger order several weeks ago, and his position in the company is down from an initial level of 28 million shares, Shapiro said, giving him... 8.5% of all shares. Let's stop there for a second. I, was about, I wish you would, because you've just numbered me to death. So how many did he start out with? He started out with 28 million shares. And how many has he got now? 15 million shares. And he has what percentage of the company now? 8.5% of all shares. Which means he had about 16 or 17% when he started, because he sold about half. One would almost think that it, it, that they've kind of in, would encourage him to, yeah, please sell all your shit and just go away. But but that has ripple effects, whether you know whether it's Satan, Hitler, or you know, goddamn Pee Wee Herman sell, uh, selling that much stock. If he just said, well, fuck it, who wants my the rest of my stock, wouldn't that do something bad to the stock? You're the expert here. Yes and no. I mean, typically if there's a run on the stock and people inside a company, inside an entity are the ones selling it, uh, that, yeah, that's a bit problematic. Now it's Vince McMahon, and I think we're getting to the point where people are just happy he's not really involved in stuff. So if he sold the shares, if someone bought them, everyone will be okay with it. If no one buys it, that could really hurt the stock. All of a sudden, someone <laughs> sells a few million shares and there isn't really a market for it at that price. That could be a problem. Well, and, and here's another thing. I mean, obviously, like I said, in a perfect world, they're probably thinking at this point, God, we wish just he would not have anything and please leave us alone. But also, what is Vince going to do? He got the several hundred million dollars here a while back. Now he's got he's going to have several hundred million. What is he doing with this money? Again, I was joking about the money bin, maybe. But, uh, I mean, is he just calling, oh, uh, buy some AT&T and some fucking Exxon? What? Or is he... Meet my personal shopper, Bruce Pritchard. What? <laughs> That's what I, I'm wondering. Is he uh, putting some money together to do? To wouldn't we hear if Vince McMahon, uh, as notorious as he is, were to buy a big piece of something or invest in a large chunk or some kind of control of something? You would you would hear about that, wouldn't you? I would think even if there was anything that was something that would have to air on television or with a streaming partner, if it was anything. Word would get out because people would be outraged that Vince McMahon was trying to get back into something. Well, I mean, even if he bought, you know, fucking four percent of Nabisco or something, you would you would hear about that, right? Because uh, I mean, <laughs> anything he could yeah. get into at this point, we would have warning, right? Yeah, if someone bought four percent of Nabisco, you may hear about it. Uh, but anyway, um, here's the thing: Did you is the other quote? Have you finished the quotes in there? Or is the other quote in there that I was liking? No, let me go to this. Reiterating the sentiment Mark Shapiro expressed on the TKO fourth quarter earnings call. We're not in conversations <laughs> with McMahon. We don't know his motives, his plans, or his timeline. 
He doesn't work for the company, doesn't come into the office, <laughs> and he's not coming back to the company. And that's where we sit. He wasn't even there. We don't know. We haven't seen him. We ain't talking to him. We don't know where he's at. Don't know what he's doing. And we don't care. We have nothing to do with this individual, and he will not be darkening our doorstep or our threshold anytime in the near future. I mean, it's almost like after that's the that's the, the interesting thing because they are, everyone played ball together for quite a while. If there is a split, and now you have Vince feeling that endeavor that Ari Emanuel, Nick Khan, Mark Shapiro, whoever it may be, turn their back on him pushed him out <laughs> and now he has all this money and still a piece of this and they gave him the rights to everything i don't know if he has any kind of non-compete not to say he would start a wrestling company because it would be like control your narrative i mean who's he gonna pick from to go work there and that's the thing i want to know how big of a impasse if any because then if they're all cool that makes this statement from mark shapiro stand out even more because it's so harsh and to the point uh, well, it, and they've been giving the impression, and I mean, there's ways you can talk even indirectly, but they'd be, oh, we haven't talked to him. Uh, but I, I wonder how amicable that last the phone call went when uh, the sponsorship got pulled over the fucking pay-per-view weekend, and they called Vince, said, well, it's starting to happen, and he, I'll resign. I wonder how amicably they left that or whether he's been ignoring them or has had a snoot full of them. You know, cause uh, that's what you, Vince, if he thinks somebody's turned his back on or their back on him or uh, whatever could be, I mean, he spent a lot of time around Barnett and he's got plenty of time to figure out how to be vindictive. But if they got Bruce there, that tells you that maybe they're not too afraid of Vince, because that's the only reason Bruce would be there. Bruce is, I mean, Ronda Rousey said it very, the best anyone has. He's the avatar of Vince. Well, I, would, I wonder if they just told everybody, hey, kayfabe Bruce. <laughs> I we shall, we shall see, but apparently Vince McMahon is not welcome at the new corporate headquarters. Did I what he's he's been there, right? I, that would be fucking Oh my god, I can see him sitting outside with one of those cartoon fucking dynamite plungers if he never actually got to move into that fucking new building. But I guess he's been in it by now. Do you think he's going to make a run at trying to I mean again, he's not someone even if he fails, he's not really someone to just take it and lay down. He's usually someone to cause a big problem. You think he's going to, I mean, forget about the lawsuit and whatever else comes out and whatever the government gets on him, whatever happens here, just in terms of the company dynamic, if he is completely pushed out, but he still has a percentage of the company, the ability to buy more. I mean, we talk about him selling. Technically, he could buy more, too. It's interesting. I mean, if they're really pushing him out the pasture, it doesn't seem like he wants to go there. He he's a disgruntled billionaire with seven or eight hundred million dollars on hand in cash that we don't know what he's doing with. And of And he's gonna almost, end up by Ted Turner. He's gonna end up alone in Montana. Well, but he's also got almost ten percent in the biggest wrestling company in the world. And seven or eight hundred billion dollars or billion seven or eight hundred million dollars in cash that we don't know what he's doing with. And did I mention the disgruntled part? <laughs> oh my God, he could he could become a real life Mr. Burns. Let's talk about news breaking today as we are recording WWE Hall of Fame welcoming the U.S. Express, Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo. Well, and and let me be the first one to congratulate them, the U.S. Express, because if it wasn't for the folks like the U.S. Express and the Rock and Roll Express keeping the expresses going. The Midnight Express would have been the only. Ex no, I'm kidding. Um, no, I th Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda are actually get overlooked because they didn't they didn't have a, a, as long a run as some of the other teams. But when we talk about, uh, you know, if if the Midnight had gone to the 
WWF in the 80s. You know, what with the man with the Bulldogs or the Heart Foundation or whatever. If I got Wyndham and Rotunda would have been perfect, and you and I never even won either. Never won either. In English this time, rewinding it, rip, 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 neither one of us ever mentioned them. Why is that? Is it just because of the short run? We're not thinking about it? Short run, short run ended as the Express was taking off. I mean, WrestleMania won. I shouldn't say that. WrestleMania won's March of 85. They lose the belts to the Sheik and Volkov. They win them back. A few months later, then Barry Windham quits. I don't know, but they lose him back before he quits. But no, they lost him to the Dream You're Team. You're rambling now. I'm rambling. I'm trying to remember the title. They lost him to the Dream Team. Uh, See, that's a, even you, the Mr. Goddamn Encyclopedia, we're having. Why are they? Why are they not on the tip of our tongue? Because Barry Windham was at in the mid '80s, one of the is certainly top five premier in-ring performers in the wrestling business, and. Mike Rotunda was a heck of a fucking athlete and a tremendous worker, not the the family lineage of, you know, the Wyndhams and the Mulligans, but he, you know, became one and a heck of a nice guy as well. And, and, but we, you know, I don't, I, I think it came out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting that. And that's that's what started me thinking about why don't we think about them more? And and they were they were brothers in law, so they were together a bunch, but they didn't have a long run as a team. Well, the other thing too is sadly, there isn't a ton of footage. Like the tag title change where they win the title. I don't even know if that whole match is out there where they beat Adonis and Murdoch. So they have matches with Adonis and Murdoch, and those really aren't out there. And there isn't a treasure trove of footage and it was a brief period of time and a lot of that stuff was them coming to the ring to born in the usa so you can't use any of that <laughs> that's right that's they were right. very big in the moment they had captain lou albano as their manager he was their first i think he was their first baby face no they were his first baby face uh tag team i should say yes. so i mean they were getting the big push and then barry windham left and they replaced him golden boy danny spivey had already been there they put him with Ooh. Mike Rotunda because he had blonde hair Ooh. so why not just put another blonde in the role I guess was the thought Ooh. but not all blondes wrestle the same <laughs> going Ooh. from Barry Windham to 1986 Dan Spivey it's like trading your house for a tent <laughs> um, it, well, but anyway uh, and you so guys would I, work with Barry Windham a bunch so I mean you oh my god yeah I, that that was again Barry Windham was incomparable in the ring at that point, and especially as a ba especially as a single baby face. I think, and he and Garvin were tremendous. Ronnie Garvin, when they had their run as a tag team, but Barry Windham in singles matches with with Flair, especially. But I can imagine how good uh, Windham and Murdoch would have been because, you know, there's Barry working with a fucking compatriot of his father's and uh, so uh, he could just do anything as a single he it wasn't the greatest promo in the world but he you could fire him up and he was a good looking guy even though he didn't have a body but he never would just fucking accept a push and follow through with the push and stay in the place of the push without quitting and going back and forth and that's what you know uh, and, and it certainly didn't help him. I'm not saying it was, you know, he would have been the biggest star since goddamn Londos, but it certainly didn't help him. I think that was his main problem. You know who that reminded me of just that description? Butch Reed. Um, I don't, Butch didn't go anywhere near uh, back and forth places as much as Barry did, do you think? He was in and out of Mid South between 84 and 85, and then he left and went to the WWF, and he didn't last there really all that long. And then he was gone from there. He showed up in the NWA. And then he was just gone after Watts came back, of all things, too. Him and Butch Reed, I guess, still didn't get along. And that was the end of Butch Reed. Yeah, but but still, Barry... Just an elite mid-'80s worker who should have done more, I guess. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll acquiesce to that. But, but the point that I was making is germane that it wasn't like Barry should have been leaving all the time. I'm not saying he was never justified, but it wasn't like he should have been leaving all the time because he's like, well, this, 
This guy wants you to be his world tag team champion. Oh, well, this guy wants to push you as his fucking main event baby phase. You leave there. Oh, this guy wants to fucking push you as a goddamn another main event baby. Oh, this guy wants to. He just, he would leave those opportunities. I mean, at, at some point, stick to the goddamn plan, right? Well, congratulations, U.S. Express. We uh... yes, but I'm I'm not not applauding either one of those guys because I I liked and enjoyed working with and alongside and watching both of them. Do they call him for this rotundo or rotunda? He was rotundo, and then when he left, I think Vince claimed ownership of the name, and he became Mike Rotunda, his real name. Uh, that, uh, yes, in answer to your question, yeah. Now, hopefully, they will. <laughs> Well, because that's why Wyndham Rotunda's name is Wyndham Rotunda, because he's part Wyndham and part Rotunda. Uh, so hopefully they'll stick with the Rotunda motif. All right, Jim. Well, there's no real transition from Rotunda to this. But Jim, let's real quick go through the Wrestling Observer Newsletter star ratings for AEW Revolution. Oh, oh good Lord. A very popular pay-per-view with the readership for the record. 546 thumbs up, 546 thumbs up, zero thumbs down, zero thumbs in the middle. Oh, so it was unanimous. It was unanimous. It was, it was unanimous. They, they, all 546 of those thumbs are straight up somebody's ass. The best match poll, the winner, Osprey versus Takeshita, 411 votes. Second place, Sting and Allen versus Young Bucks. 104 votes. Third place, Eddie Kingston versus Brian Danielson. 25 votes. Worst match, Tony Storm versus Deanna Perazzo. 244 votes. Oh, I think they, they overachieved that in numerous other matches that were much worse than anything. Those two, they, it was only two, two of them. How could they possibly stink as bad as the eight man? The All-Star Scramble, 123 votes. <laughs> The Bang Bang Scissor Gang versus Private Party and Jarrett and Lethal and Sing and Mac. <laughs> we thankfully missed that. 59 votes. And Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. And finally, Nightingale and Statlander defeated, or not defeated, but versus Heart and Blue. <laughs> 52 <laughs> votes for a Heart and Blue. And, uh... <sighs> And and then next week we'll be tangled up in blue. That's a wonderful song. I love that song. <clears throat> blood on the tracks. There was blood on the uh, revolution here, and and rain on the scarecrow as well. But nevertheless, well, the uh, first man. Match... Hey, hey, let, let me let me ask. You, hold on here a second. Do you have your your calculator close by hand, or is it on your computer along with everything else? Could no. you do just a, a bit of simple mathematics for me? Let's do it. I got it right here. Okay, what is a successful pay-per-view for AEW? I say pay-per-view, but all sources, people watching it, the people buying it on whatever means. They they say that if they do 150,000, they're just they're happy as clams about that, right? I think if it's even a little less than that, I think if they do 120,000, they're happy. If they do 150,000, it's like, "Oh, wow, this really worked." Okay, well, well, let's say 120,000 because I'm going to give the other side the benefit of the doubt. What percentage is the 546 people that voted for this poll in the Wrestling Observer of the 120,000 that hopefully bought it if it was successful, which we assume it was? Well, you didn't tell me those percentages we were doing. Hold on. Well, I said a little simple mathematics. So give me the numbers again. Hey, well, I'm tracking <laughs> deep. I'm glad you're not my accountant. If if, if a hundred and I don't know how you say this, if 120,000 people bought the thing, or at least that, then what percentage is the 546 people that voted in this poll to determine whether it was a good show or not? 546 is what percentage of 120,000? That's there you go. It is 0.455%. Point four five. So this is the opinion of point four five five percent of the viewing audience that we're about to go through here. Well, you know they like their stuff. Yeah. Well, here are the uh, star ratings, Jim. The Bang Bang Scissor Gang versus Private Party and Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal and Satnam Singh and Willie Mack. 
Two stars. We didn't see that. Sounds like it's great. Apparently, Pack is on his way back in, it says here. Where has he been? Is he still... What the fuck? Hello? He got one of those CMLL visas. I don't know. Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander beat Julia Hart and Sky Blue. Two-star match. Two-star match. Here we go with stuff you saw. Christian Cage defeating Daniel Garcia in okay. 1641. Yeah, at least. Three and three-quarter stars. All right. He's, he's very, very... Uh generous to the the stuff that actually people see that makes the the air on the main show as they say eddie kingston defeated brian danielson in 19 minutes and 46 seconds every bit of it four four and three quarter stars what the what hello wait hold up what the f i got four plug something. and three quarter stars what did I remember watching a match between? I remember inventing this star system. What the? F I, re I remember watching. A, yes, I remember watching a match between Brian Danielson and Eddie Kingston. I don't think it was the one that apparently was better than anything that Kurt Angle has ever been involved with at the same level as Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, and Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat. What the fuck is he on? How could? Vi I, vitamin I T, vitamin TK. That's what he's on. I don't even under. How was that in any way a nearly a five star wrestling match on anybody's? If the scale was one to ten, I'd I'd be all over that. Then that'd be fine. But what are we talking about here? Well, let's continue on here. Wardlow won an eight man scramble match. Sixteen minutes and twenty two seconds. It certainly was three and a quarter stars. It certainly wasn't, but uh, at least we're back down to some level of cognitive reality. Roderick Strong defeated Orange Cassidy, 12 minutes and 42 seconds. I'll take their word for it. Four-star match. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right. John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli defeated FTR, 21 minutes, 45 seconds. Every excruciating bit of it. Four and three quarter stars. Oh, good God almighty Jesus Christ on a cracker. Lord, deliver me. Help me. Help Elizabeth. I'm coming home to you. What? <sighs> Tony Storm defeated Deanna Perrazzo in 12 minutes and 17 seconds. Two and three quarter stars. Oh, Jesus Christ. Well, he just wiped his fucking ass with them, didn't he? Will I is that wait a minute, wait a minute. If you could say the plumber was out here with his fake looking bullshit and his nasty ass corpse looking fucking demeanor, and he laid a, a complete turd in the middle of the ring, and I give him four and three quarter stars, and you come out and I give you two point whatever. That apparently he has just goddamn sentenced them to the fucking obscurity forever that had to hurt people's feelings it says here the two wrestled well but they couldn't follow the prior match what god the two wrestled well but it seems to me that there could be some issues with following the prior performance <laughs> in match nine will osprey defeated Ken it's every every single one of them i thought <laughs> it was match number 16 <laughs> will osprey defeated kanosuke Takeshita in 21 minutes and 58 seconds good lord again five and three quarter stars oh what the fucking <laughs> you have got to be out of your foot what in it's the official sports? he's anointed his new favorite there it is he's broken past the five star scale Will Ospreay. Okay, so a, a cold match with no even storyline reason being able to be given by the manager of both men for it to happen just so they could do a bunch of moves to each other while both wearing the same kind of fucking determined face to remember all of their dance routines. And they are wonderful athletes. Of all the people doing this phony fucking shit, they're in the best shape. And suddenly this is... <laughs> why, why, don't you let okay. Dave, why don't you let Dave say it best? Okay. This was a collection of big trademark spots by both. Takeshita used a superplex. Osprey did a springboard forearm. 
Osprey did a springboard Enzigurian plancha. <laughs> Takeshita did a running kick and flip dive. Takeshita <laughs> came off the top with a senton, but Osprey got his knees up. Takeshita did one of the best German suplexes you'll see. <laughs> they continue to do big moves, including all kinds of hook kicks by Osprey. A tiger driver for a near fall. I think it's supposed to be a near fall. Wait, wait is, that, is, that, is that where he picked him up, dropped him on his fucking head, and almost broke his neck? Oh, no, that was coming up still, I think. Oh, okay. And a spinning back suplex and os cutter. Takeshita was supposed to suplex Osprey on the turnbuckle, but missed the turnbuckle. Yeah. Osprey ended up with a big lump on his back from that one. He looked seriously hurt for a second, but came back. There was one spot where Osprey did a springboard off the wait ropes. A wait a minute, wait a minute. And also, just here, said you have done a move where you have convinced the biggest watcher of fucking goofy ass wrestling on the planet Earth that you're really fucked up and you're right back up not selling it. What the fuck? There was one spot where Osprey did a springboard off the ropes into Takeshita, catching him with a blue thunder bomb. Osprey won with a Styles Clash, Storm Driver, and Hidden Blade. <laughs> and a partridge in a pear tree. And I'll say this now. I know we're going to talk about Dynamite on the uh, experience. And I know you probably won't see it because it ran the 1006 again <laughs> here at Last Manor. But I thought Osprey versus Fletcher was better than him versus Takeshita. And I liked the match, obviously, better than you did. I don't know if I would break the five star system for it. Oh, but but you know what that means then. But I thought the Fletcher it, match was better. That's what I mean. Uh, has anybody checked on Dave? Could he could he be like who was that basketball player they found out in the fucking in uh, Nevada at the at the brothel that just fucked himself to, into a goddamn coma by partying for like three days? Lamar Odom? There you go. Well, it, it, Dave might be like old, old Odin there. He may just come so hard by seeing something like this that it, if, if he gets to eight stars, I'm afraid that he'll rupture some kind of goddamn urethral fucking tube or something. Well, let's uh, finish the star ratings here, Jim. Before we get any urethral eruptions. That's right. Samoa Joe retained the AEW the AEW <laughs> title over Adam Page and Swerve Strickland. 19 minutes, 41 seconds. Four and a half stars. <sighs> and uh, I, I'm, I'm not even going to try anymore to even think what's inside his head. Otherwise, then, have you noticed that Poor, poor Dave, he almost feels incapable of giving a match that goes over 20 minutes less than four stars. It's like, is he p punching a time clock? Is he putting in the time on this? And finally, Sting and Darby Allen defeated the Young Bucks. 21 minutes, two seconds. Four and three quarter stars. <sighs> what did he think about old Darby's swan dive into the... Uh, into the pit of glass. Uh, let's see. Sting's sons did stinger splashes. They were a little awkward. <laughs> St uh, we go back down. Matt powerbombed Allen on a ladder. Awkward. Awkward. Uh, Allen went for a swanton off the next to last rung of a 12-foot ladder in the ring onto Nick. But Nick moved, and Allen went through a pane of glass that was held up by four chairs. Six. Alan had dozens of small cuts on his back, which very quickly Alan's back looked like it was attacked with a chainsaw. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> he had adjudicated them small cuts there. Thank you, Dr. Meltzer. Tiny little cuts all Tiny over Darby. Tiny little cuts in my wood apartment. <laughs> all over my little weenie. <laughs> <laughs> well, there it is. AEW Revolution, a ra just an amazing success. <sighs> and of course, we'll talk about the ratings and everything else on the uh, experience in a few days. But Jim, when you talk about ratings like this and all of this, <laughs> these things that qualify as this, if you're an AEW fan, you may think, you know, I just want to sell my collection. How can I sell all this stuff enough? I don't know if you could sell that if you don't have the rights to it, but if you have other stuff to sell, we well, know someone who could help you sell it. 
Well, hey, uh, we've got some friends. It just depends on, on what you got to sell as to whether they might be able to help you sell it. We can work some things out, but I tell what they should have done over there at the big pay-per-view extravaganza was they should have gathered up all of that broken glass with Darby Allen's blood and DNA and TNA and all that stuff all, in, all over it, and they should have taken it home and sold it, but you got to go to eBay. You got to go to eBay to sell stuff if you want to be just a, a mark walking down the street with that chalk on your back going, hey, screw me over. You need to take control of this thing. You need to make it a business, Brian. You need to open your own businesses, which not you personally, because you already have, but I'm talking the royal you to our listeners out there, the people, the cult of Cornette. Open your own businesses. Throw off the shackles of the corporate greed of the big companies that have you horn-swoggled and chained to the bowels of a slave ship and become your own kind of capitalist. Make your own kind of music. Live your own kind of song or whatever they say there. And Shopify is the global commerce platform that is going to help you sell at every stage of your business. Come up with something you want to sell. They will figure out how to give you a platform. And from that platform, you will jump off into success, ladies and gentlemen. You'll make a fortune. As a matter of fact, That's it's not almost a guarantee. guaranteed. No, it's absolutely well, it's all, not it's, guaranteed. It's almost guaranteed that if you start with $1,000, you'll end up with at least $500. That's almost guaranteed. Again, no See? guarantees, but you have the opportunity. And you sell. got the opportunity to go the other way. Yeah, you could actually make a fortune. <laughs> you can make a, you can't, you can make a you fortune. It is an option sell. that could happen. Yes. Well, who are you to be a negative, nattering nabob of negativity? I'm negative. not being negative. Well, then, folks, wherever and whatever you're selling, whether you're auctioning off autographed apparel or selling sleek skis, according to the things that I'm reading here, some of these blurbs from the fine customers of Shopify, they can help you sell everywhere. They've got an all-in-one e-commerce platform, an in-person POS system, that person is a POS, and they will come to you in person and prove it. Whatever you're selling, Shopify, or Shopify, and also the Sop see, Shopify is this new gravy business that I'm starting that I'm going to sell on Shopify. And it'll help you turn browsers into buyers because they've got the Internet's best converting checkout. Brian, I believe I've told you the statistic is up to 36% better. So right there, you're going you're gonna to have people checking out 36% more often. And everybody knows what that well, means. That doesn't mean more often. It just means they think it's better. Well, it's 36% it's better. Right. That so doesn't mean more often. Just, well, well uh, more often or better or bigger. You'll make 36% more money, ladies and gentlemen, as soon as you hook up with Shopify. That's, that's right there in, in black and white. You can... You, you, oh, because they power 10% of all the e-commerce in the U S. So if you're a customer in commerce for the e-commerce, they are the commercial people that you should contact. And they've got millions of entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries standing by. You can be one of their entrepreneurs. You can join this secretive underground but yet massively growing in number brethren of people doing things secret ways no, to make more money it's not underground and there's no secrecy involved it's out in the open and anyone any one of you listeners can work with shopify to sell your fine products or homemade handmade or officially licensed or some well, sort of documentation we don't care if you drop down and shit them in the parking lot if you want to sell them and people want to buy them, but nope. they're not going to tell you. Don't sell defecation. That's a bad idea. <laughs> so they're, they're not going to tell you all their secrets of how to do all of this until you sign up for the dollar a month trial period at Shopify.com. They're certainly not going to do that. So you've got to you've got to mine their incredible knowledge of how to do these things that they do for millions of these other entrepreneurs from from skyway to sewers all over 175 countries you got to give them a dollar and and they're going to from their one bedroom apartment they're going to send you 
all the information, and then you're going to get a trial period at Shopify.com slash JCE. That's all lowercase, by the way, the JCE. That's important for some reason. I think it's a code just to make sure you're one of the cool people. So you go to Shopify.com slash JCE right now to grow your business like a massively growing fungus. No matter what stage you're in, it's going to get bigger and more malignant. Shopify.com slash JCE, and you're going to get a $1 a month trial period right smacking now. That's right, smack it now. What's that promo code one more time, Mr. Smack? JCE in the in the lower of cases. All right, well, before we get out of here, let's talk about one more thing, Jim, with the upper of cases. And there's a lot of other things happening. We'll talk about Okada and his contract on the experience. But WWE Rivals, let's talk about it because you watched it. Oh, boy. I've, hold on, I have notes over. I didn't know where you were going, what you were doing here. I got notes over here. Sure sounds like it. Well, these are notes from, How from many previous pages of notes. Yeah, what is no, going on? No, I'm I'm trying to get to it. Are they bound? I'm trying to get to it. It's on a pad. Yellow pad? Well, it's, it's, it's goddamn as brave as the next pad, I'll have you know. <laughs> Fucking right. casting aspersions on pad my my pad's guts or intestinal fortitude. I wonder if it was legal size or regulation. No, it, it's it's perfectly legal to have a pad this size, but it's it's more in the in the area of regulation than it is in the in the legal world. That's why I'd flip so many pages. You're talking about the Rivals program with Jake the Snake Roberts and Randy Macho Man Savage, are you not? That is indeed the one that aired. Yes. Well, it is a this is it's an amuse bouche for the wrestling fan. These rivals programs, I've, I'm a bigger fan of the biographies, to be quite honest, because we're focusing on, an, you know, a, a subject and they can tell a story and they're usually two hours and they have more time. The rivals, it's a one hour program. By the time you take the commercials out, you're down to 46 minutes. Then you've got the the panel of, of consisting of people who weren't there or weren't even born whenever whatever they're talking about was taking place. and the talking heads, some of whom, uh, you know, fit the picture, but some of whom are in the same category. So you get to see the old footage. And a lot of this stuff, these topics, have come up in the biographies of these different people. Because, we, you know, we, I don't remember whether it was the Jake biography or whether it was the Savage biography that we got the snake bite story told. Um... It, it's wonderful to keep things like that alive, but I just, I watch these for, for the old footage and just to remind me how much more intense in every way, whether it was lighthearted or dark and evil or violent or comedic or whatever, everything was more intense, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s, as we see from these programs, than What's the difference, Brian? You're looking at it from from more of afar than I am just because I've been in the middle of it for so long. But why is uh, all this shit, it's, is it the high-definition television? We d we're, we're getting shit that misses and shit that doesn't look good if it connects to begin with and no emotion in the promos and no violence in the struggles and no, I mean, what is it? You had people that were over. You had people that were established and they were never treated too foolishly on TV. Even the guys that were kind of, you know, mid card or below. And because of that, you could bring other people in and slot them in and give them credibility by having them interact with or potentially beat one of these people. A lot of that protocol seemed to have switched over the years you know, by the time they did this feud in 91, Randy Savage had been there since 85, Jake since 86. And they are two of the more memorable names and personalities of that era. But when you go back and watch one of those Royal Rumbles, it blows you away how many of these guys are like all-time greats. You know, in your eyes, if you grew up during that era, you know, they're just in this match. And they stood out. The crowds were different, too. It wasn't just that they were energetic. Look at the makeup of the crowd. <laughs> 
Look at who was buying wrestling tickets. There were more kids then. They were still, it seemed like working class people in good seats. You get different reactions. And it's a different kind of fan. It's not just five guys all wearing t-shirts going to the show and sitting next to each other. And you've made valid points, and every single one of them I agree with, with everything you said, but that explains the the popularity of the, the talent, the, them getting over, the, the crowd reaction then versus now, but it doesn't explain still the actual commission of the act, the actual shit, the match or the angle or the what these guys... <laughs> Look like they mean it. Even it, and again, Savage was one of the all-time, you know, great promos and in the ring, amazing athlete. You can't say enough about all of that stuff. And we've talked about him a million times. Jake had an incredible promo and delivery and psychology in his mind for what he was doing and how he could get over. And he was just a good enough athlete in the ring to pull it off, right? And that's not denigrating anybody. That's just being honest. But it, it just, it looked, <laughs> all of these guys from this era, because they they got into the wrestling business when it was still the wrestling business, when it was the territories, or when it was at least being trained as such. And there they there's an element of we've got to go out and fucking sell this to their approach. They're, they're motivated, whereas, and I'm not saying nobody does that now, but there's no few and far between levels of believable conflict where it looks like these guys are trying to tear their fucking eyeballs out. And it, it, it can't just be that the high def TV shows that everybody's missing shit by a mile and a half and everybody's putting up a hand to block. I, I look at these things. Because I spent years training people how to do them without having to put your hand up in front of your face and block every goddamn thing that comes at you. Randy Savage, by this point, had been wrestling close to 20 years. Eh, maybe a little less, 15 years or so. Jake Roberts, same thing. They're seasoned veterans. They know how to do stuff. Jake Roberts knew how to do more with less than anyone and get away well, with and, it. And, that is true. And the other thing is, you know, to compare modern stuff to then, Randy Savage scripted out a lot of his matches, but he did it so that they worked within the confines of what was happening, not let's script it out. Hey, I want to do cool stuff. Well, the referee will have to see it. Who cares? We'll just do it. Yeah, he didn't write down a list of moves and then figure out an order to, to do them in. He wrote down a... A story in the a, ring. A stage play in the ring. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's, you know, a difference between the two. But so I have a couple of observations and we maybe discuss a couple things about the, the program again. The best part is the, you know, the, the old footage, but they took you through the, the rivalry that they had. And again, when they do the little, everybody's little backstory, Elizabeth was preposterous when they introduced her as a manager. <laughs> when, when all of the the uh, uh, various managers in the WWF at the time wanted this guy, and they're all standing in the ring, and, you know, there's legendary managers and veteran wrestlers and blah, blah, blah. And, and, jo out, and Johnny you know, Valiant. And Johnny Valiant, yes. And, uh, and here comes Elizabeth out looking like a beauty pageant contestant and with just a lost deer-in-the-headlights <laughs> smile on her face. And, well... He's picked her. It, how would she manage his career? I'm not saying she was a, a person devoid of personal worth. I'm saying why, if you wanted to someone to be your wrestling manager, how did what was her background? It was never presented. That they, why and in, in what way she would manage him? Well, two things. One, one of my favorite things ever is Bruno San Martino when she comes out. What is his reaction to her coming out? He goes, "Who is she? Some kind of movie star or something?" <laughs> A movie star or something? What? What does that even mean? But anyway. <laughs> well, I bet because they probably didn't smart Bruno up, and also he's thinking, what is this? She is this Liz Taylor, like I've said in the movies? <laughs> Sophia Loren, who is this? Yes, I don't know. On. Hey. The other thing is, early on, before they really went with the slightly abusive Randy Savage Elizabeth relationship, whatever you want to call it, she was kind of heelish early on. 
She helped him cheat. She did things, and then they quickly switched it and made her completely the babe in the woods who Georgie Animal Steel wanted to win the affection of. Okay, because I don't ever remember even seeing, and of course I was not a, a regular close watcher of WWF programming during that point in time, but didn't I don't remember ever seeing her interfere except when she got up on the ring to uh, take her dress off or skirt off and distract whoever the fuck yeah, for Hogan. DiBiase and Jesse Ventura. Jesse Ventura had never seen yeah. a pair of legs before. It was just... Flames. Yeah, she was... She, it was shockingly wearing what she would wear to go to Walmart in, in this day and age. But <laughs> anyway, so... Um, what do I'm just... It's it, it, true. It, it's true. The it one thing if she like flashed him. Like, look at this. That would have yeah, blown people's I mean, minds you know, in 1988. Marlena went... All the way to the bone for the business, baby, on that shotgun Saturday night. She's full of spunk. Uh, So in 1991, Randy Savage lost to the Ultimate Warrior, and they replayed that. And, of course, I've never made it a habit of watching Ultimate Warrior matches after the first couple. So to see the way that this prick casually pinned Savage with one (laughs) foot on his chest makes me hate him even more than I already did. You would hate him even more if you saw what really happened. And I was a kid who loved the Ultimate Warrior, and it was a great match. For him, it was like a <laughs> four-star match for the Ultimate Warrior. That and the Hogan match and the Rick Rude stuff were like the best ones. But Randy Savage hits the Warrior, I want to say five elbow drops in a row. Oh, good God. And then the Warrior kicks out. <laughs> and the Warrior kicks his ass and pins him with a foot on the chest. <sighs> and then Randy well, Savage retires, but Elizabeth's in the crowd and can't take the abuse of Sherry Martell, so she makes the save, and turns out they loved each other all along. Well, and that's the thing that Vince was... I don't know what his fascination was, and this was for those people, even before any of the story that's out there may have potentially even happened. He kept trying to retire Savage. That's how I ended up doing color on Raw for about three months. In 93 was when Savage left the next time he had retired him to the... But anyway, um, but they do do the wedding in at SummerSlam in 91, and that's when Liz opens the box with the snake in it. And now Savage can't fight Jake because he's an announcer, and... Of course, Jake, this did highlight that before the the various chemicals burned whatever parts of his brain, he was so good and smooth and just on top of everything verbally. And they did the reinstate campaign for to, to get reinstated. And that's where they went into the... <laughs> but again, it's, it's great, this fucking story. Not only that they went to these links for the angle, but also it illustrates Savage. The snake bite deal where Savage came in that afternoon. He's like, uh, brother, uh, the, you need to take the snake bite first. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. And he actually, Jake had to let the snake bite him in the locker room. And this is true. This is not Jake having had delusions somewhere in a fever. Uh, he had to let the snake bite him first before Savage would do the angle in the ring. Of course, it wasn't pissed off like in the ring and latched on and didn't let go, or I don't think Savage would have gone through with it. But in what other business does this kind of thing take place? Brian, that's why I love it so much. Ringling Brothers. I don't even think they had a mandatory snake biting going on at Ringling Brothers. I think there was some there was a snake union there, though. What if a Jake had said no? Like, I'm not going to let this thing bite me. Get out of here. The reason you're doing it is because I wouldn't do it. No, I guarantee you that Savage will, oh, I ain't going to do it then, brother. Because he was so paranoid. He, you know, (laughs) he had to make sure. Did you love it when Jack Tunney barred all reptiles from ringside? All reptiles. I barred from, what a personality and charisma from Jack Tunney. Well, remember, he did his best work in the office behind the scenes, but I had forgotten also, or don't know that I cared to begin with, uh, that that when Savage got reinstated, they did the pay-per-view match with him and Jake on this Tuesday in Texas, the the comeback, what, four or five days after SummerSlam 91 Thanksgiving night, 
or not SummerSlam, but Survivor Series, Survivor not Series. Even Thanksgiving night. That's yes, right. that's what I'm trying. That's why it's Thanksgiving night because it was Survivor Series. But why did they they put that big of a match on this Tuesday in Texas? No, they put a bigger match. That was also the rematch between Hogan and was it Hogan and the Undertaker? Was that what well? Was? Yeah, but yeah. yes, but I know, but I mean that was the angle of why they were doing it because they shot the angle at Survivor Series and were coming. It was an experiment of Vince's to come back that quick with a rematch, but they also loaded it up with a goddamn. I would have thought you'd put Savage and Jake on Survivor Series. It just being me, but nevertheless, if that had worked out really well, we would have never had Raw. We would have just had weekly pay per views at that point. <laughs> well, I think that oh you know, by. Uh, th th you know, that's an idea that uh, maybe they should have figured out at TNA early on because Vince had tried it and it didn't work just uh, two weeks in a row. And then, you know, at, at the Rumble, Randy dumped Jake and then jumped over himself to get at Jake. And then they did the Saturday night's main event. And again, the, the highlights of that, even if Jake and Savage, more violent, but yet safer. Everything I'm seeing them do, I see what they're doing, and, and, and it's as safe as you can make these things, and they're executing it well. But it looks more violent. I don't, I, I don't know how to explain it. But anyway, that was the the rivalry between all the way from goddamn, I think, the summer of one year to the goddamn February of another year. That's a to rival Bobo Brazil and the Sheik kind of feud. They did have a really fun match in like 86 on Saturday night's main event, but that wasn't even mentioned here. And that was Rivals. What, what a wonderful panel, too. Freddie Prince Jr. in the investigation room. <laughs> yes. With the other forensic wrestlers. Do they make, when everybody comes down to sit at that table, do they spray them down with the fucking fungicide or whatever they do, the decontamination thing, and then they sit in there? It's just a shame that they don't say anything. <laughs> they say nothing. It's like Tony Schiavone times four. Or five, I guess. But Freddie Prince is just the host of that group. But another WWE Rivals. Another Rivals. Another drive through Jim, with that, I look for a marimba. Oh, for heaven's sake. I look for a marimba. Kalimba. Mahamba. Who my pretty That's mama. not how any of that goes. The drive through is closed. Now, you know, some tone. kid's going to think it's the ice cream man and wander out the front door down the street and get picked up in a panel van of some kind of hippies from Cleveland. Yeah, I don't know about all that, but uh, if you worry about all that, call Stephen P. New. 877-50-STEVE is what some people may say. 877-50-STEVE. We'll back if next. anybody in a panel van takes anything or anybody from your family, call 177-50-STEVE and he'll get it back. 177? Well, or 1877, yes. 1877-50-STEVE. All right. He'll get down. back the lost eight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be, back. <laughs> we'll be back on the Jim Cornette experience before you know it. And of course, next week, pack here on the drive-thru. Go through the archive, patreon.com slash cornette. $5 a month, get you access to the archive going back to 2013, patreon.com slash Cornette. Don't forget the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll come right up. Travis Heckle artwork, full episodes, clips of the episodes, omnibus collections, with much more to come. The official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. Follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. Hear me on the 605 Super Podcast. And of course, check out the Wrestling News every day. TheWrestlingNews.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Cornette's Collectibles at JimCornette.com. What say you? Everything you need to live a happy life is on sale now at JimCornette.com. So just feast your eyes and fantasize. That's right, at JimCornette.com. As we said, the drive-thru is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 877-50-STEVE. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until the Jim Cornette experience in a couple of days, and next week right back here on the drive-thru, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! <laughs>